Convocation of Baltimore County for Tuesday, October 10th, 2023. I invite you to recite the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag to be led by Ms. Kayla Drummond. We will then have a moment of silence and recognition of those who have served education in Baltimore County. I pledge allegiance to, to the, the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Tonight's Board of Education meeting is being broadcast through the BCPS online live meeting broadcast and on BCPS TV, Xfinity Channel 73, and Verizon Fios Channel 34. In order to efficiently conduct this meeting, all voting items this evening will be done by roll call vote. The first item on the agenda is the consideration of the October 10th agenda. Dr. Rogers, are there any additions or changes to tonight's agenda? I am not aware of any changes or additions to tonight's agenda. Hearing none, the agenda stands as presented. Earlier this evening, the board met in closed session pursuant to the Open Meetings Act for the following reasons, to discuss the appointment, employment, assignment, promotion, discipline, demotion, compensation, removal, resignation, or performance evaluation of appointees, employees, or officials over whom it has jurisdiction, or any other personnel matter that affects one or more specific individuals, and consult with counsel to obtain legal advice. The summary of the closed session and open session information summary can be found on board docs under this board meeting agenda date. The next item on the agenda is personnel matters and for that I call on Mr. McCall. Good evening. Good evening Chair Lichter, Vice Chair Harvey, Superintendent Dr. Rogers, members of the board. I like the board's consent for the following personnel matters, terminations, retirements, resignations, leaves, certificate appointments, and Southeast Area Education Advisory Council appointment. Okay, so do I have a motion to approve the personnel matters as presented in exhibit D1? So moved from Pong. Thank you, do I have a second? Second, Young. Thank you, any discussion? May I have a roll call vote, please? Ms. Dominowski? Yes. Mr. Young? Yes. Ms. Dolusky? Yes. Ms. Frampong? Yes. Ms. Hen? Ms. Harvey? Yes. Ms. Pumphrey? Yes. <clears throat> Dr. Savoy? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Booker Dwyer? Yes. Ms. Lichter? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Do I have a motion to approve the personal matters as presented in exhibits D2 through D6? So moves Stolusky. Thank you. Do I have a second? Second from Pong. Thank you. Any discussion? May I have a roll call vote, please? Ms. Dominowski? Yes. Mr. Young? Yes. Ms. Dolesky? Yes. Ms. Frampong? Yes. Ms. Harvey? Yes. Ms. Drummond? Yes. Ms. Pumphrey? Yes. Dr. Savoy? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Booker Dwyer? Yes. Ms. Lichter? Yes. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is unfinished business. Oh, thank you, Mr. McCall, sorry. <laughs> the next item on the agenda is unfinished business, proposed 2024-2025 school calendar. And for that, I call Ms. Charlie Green and Ms. Spilsky. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening, Board Chair Lichter, Vice Chair Harvey, uh, Dr. Rogers, and members of the Board of Education. I'm here this evening with Staff Relations Manager Julie, I'm, I'm sorry, Joelle Bilski, to present for the Board's consideration two additional options for the proposed 2024-2025 school calendar. At this time, I will turn it over to Ms. Bilski to share um, the options that we've come up with, and at the close of that, we are certainly available to answer any questions the Board would have. Good evening. As a result of the motion put forth by the Board of Education on September 26, the Department of Staff Relations was tasked with minimizing the number of half days in the proposed calendar. 
Next slide, thank you. The proposed calendar encompasses 191 teacher days, 181 elementary student days, and 182 middle and high school student days, with an additional three days built into the calendar as inclement weather days. The calendar does not allow room for an added one full day closure as a mental health day, because if BCPS were to close one full day, the teacher day total would drop to 190 days. The current calendar exceeds the required number of student hours built into the school calendar should the board decide to reinstate half-day mental health days. However, the student teacher days cannot be altered because we have just met the requirement to maintain compliance. The calendar committee will research the use of half days for upcoming school year calendars. This slide reflects attendance data for the day before Thanksgiving and the day before winter break for the last two years. Happy to entertain any questions. Questions or comments from board members? Ms. Booker Dwyer. And so thank you for this um, information. And so could you just talk a little bit about the approach for to make half days as productive as possible? And maybe this is for Dr. Rogers, um, so that it's not just movies or um, makeup assignments. Sure, uh, Ms. Booker Dwyer, uh, uh, Ms. Bielski, are you finished all the slides? I am. Oh, okay. <laughs> I have several slides. All right. Um, so, absolutely happy to uh, discuss that. So, part of the feedback that we received um, for the board was about making sure that our half days uh, were purposeful for all students. And so, in the uh, past, we have shared with our teachers that half days are an opportunity uh, for students that need extra time, for students that need to complete the work, um, that that's some of the work that we need done in addition to the three half days that are built in for grading and reporting. Um, some of the work that we are going to move forward is uh, working directly with our advisory groups uh, that uh, contain principals, uh, feedback from assistant principals, as well as teachers and school-based staff to um, identify what are some robust activities that currently exist in some schools so we can provide a set of guidelines to all, all of our schools in terms of what we expect to happen on those days. Um, and so it can look like anything from um, make up our opportunities as well as uh, if, you know, if there are things that normally happen that disrupt schedules, whether we're talking about career day, whether we're talking about, you know, a college fair, um, different opportunities for uh, students. Uh, we do a lot of work uh, with external partners, bringing in them in on those days to make sure that those days are worthwhile for our students. So whether it's, uh, if it's, um, not teaching bell to bell. Uh, it's teaching some of those meaningful lessons that we would normally incorporate on a full day so that we're not disrupting those days to the extent possible and maximizing the use of the half days. And just one more follow-up question, because we get a lot of emails about the post-Labor Day um, calendar. So could you just clarify um, why a post-Labor Day calendar wasn't shown to the board? Sure. So we did discuss, we discussed both, both a pre and a post. Um, the data that was shared with the calendar committee strongly spoke to the need for the, the maximized amount of assessment days. Um, a lot of the discussion was about kindergarten testing and needing, and the deadline for that, and needing that time to meet the deadline. Other questions or comments? Okay, public comment on the proposed 2024-2025 school calendar is the next agenda item under public comment. Comment may also be sent to board um, to the board members at boe at bcps.org. Consideration of the calendar will take place at the board's November 7th, 2023 meeting. Thank you, ladies. Thank you. Our next item is public comment, and this is one of the opportunities the board has provides to hear the views and receive the advice of community members. The members of the board appreciate hearing from interested citizens. As appropriate, we will refer your concerns to the superintendent for follow-up by her staff. 
If not selected to address the board, members of the public may submit their comments to the board members via email at boe at bcps.org. The Baltimore County Police Department's Homeland Security Unit and the Office of School Safety has recommended the following safety and security protocols. Participants should be seated, seated in the room during meetings. Individuals who need to stand should go out into the hallway to do so. Participants should not approach the table unless called upon to speak and should not approach the DS. Materials brought to the table are limited to electronic devices, presentation papers, and posters no larger than 11 by 14 inches. Other items should be left in your seats. Documents to be given to the board are to be handed to the staff member who is seated in the front area of the meeting space. Information for other attendees is to be left on the designated table outside in the hall. In the event of an emergency that requires an emergency response, such as a lockdown, lockout, or evacuation, staff from the Office of School Safety will direct participants. While we encourage public input on policy programs and practices within the purview of this board and the school system, this is not the proper form to address specific student or employee matters or to comment on matters that do not relate to public education in Baltimore County. Disparaging or derogatory remarks towards students and staff will not be tolerated. Inappropriate personnel remarks or other behavior that disrupts or interferes with the conduct of this meeting are out of order. Persons using language that is threatening or promotes violence against a BCPS employee are subject to legal penalties. Persons who otherwise disrupt or disturb this meeting will not be allowed to continue their remarks and will be escorted from the meeting. Please observe the three minute clock, which will let you know when you're time is up. The microphone will be turned off at the end of the time and it could be turned off if a speaker addresses specific student or employee matters or is commenting on matters not related to the public education in Baltimore County. It is the practice of this board to allow elected officials to provide their comments to the board and our first to speak is Delegate, Delegate Pastor. Nope. <laughs> First to speak is Delegate Pestor. Welcome, Delegate. Good evening. Good evening, Chair Lichta, Vice Chair Harvey, and Superintendent Rogers, members of the board. Tonight, people are hurting all over the world. I have been in deep contemplation and prayer for the last 24 hours wanting to do something that will make a difference. But I rewind and I know I probably won't because I am just one. Or maybe that's an excuse. So here I am up front because I'm an elected official. But in my reality, knowing that tonight I have only the heart of a human being and the heart of a person who loves children. While in my contemplative state, I went over a book I read many years ago while getting my supervisory certification in education, Other People's Children. I thought about how good people too often become afraid of others for reasons that sometimes lack rational thinking or kind hearts. They lose sight of injustices and inequities. Our fears have often been tied to race and religion, culture, ethnicity, historical truths, geography, and yes, gender affiliation and identities. To you, the board members, I am sure that at this point in time, the law of the land is clear about who falls under Title IX. Now, you may well challenge MSDE regarding the rights of those who are transgender, but as the case in Talbot County proved to be so, the courts will side with federal law and you will lose. But not only will you lose that battle, but we will all lose our humanity. There's another book which was brought to mind, The Body Keeps the Score. How we lash out at our children and victimize them manifests the dangers we do to them emotionally. 
our children are our present and our future. And our society depends on how we treat them, talk about them, and characterize them. I want, like I hope most of you, if not all, our children to feel good about themselves so their voices will resound loudly and clearly about the inclusive society we claim this country to be. And as a person who grew up in a segregated society, stoked by fear, biases, and lack of understanding, my parents raised me to believe, or pulling from the book or movie, the help. What I want our children to be able to say with confidence, I am kind, I am smart, I am important. Laws are made to protect. So if we don't like them, we should work civilly with those who make them, always with the good of children in mind, to build them up, not to destroy. So following the law, let's find civil and humane ways to accommodate the needs of all children. Use the law, speak to those who make the laws, not to those of you whose job is to protect <coughs> the children under the law. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Delegate Sheila Ruth, so welcome. Madam Chair, Good Madam, evening. Madam Vice Chair, Dr. Rogers, members of the board, it's a pleasure to see all of you and I, I thank you for your service to the children of Baltimore County. I'm here today because I've heard that a small but vocal minority is pushing for policies that, that would be discriminatory bathroom policies. I can't believe that we actually even have to have this conversation. I know that the Baltimore County Board of Education will do the right thing and not discriminate against children, not enact policies that will discriminate. But I'm here because I want you to know we have your back. As you could probably tell from the large group of people outside shouting, protect trans kids, most people in Baltimore County know that there's no basis for discriminatory policies that force children to use a bathroom, um, that um, force children to use a bathroom um, for whose identity doesn't match their biology. And that such policies are harmful to those children. I understand that you've heard from people who believe that their children are at risk of violence from transgender people. This is false. Transgender people are much more likely to be victims of violence than perpetrators. The safety of all children is important, including the safety of trans children. Forcing them to use a bathroom that doesn't match their gender identity puts their health and safety at risk. A separate gender neutral bathroom is also not an acceptable alternative and is inherently discriminatory, especially if it's more distant from the other bathrooms. And it can also out children who are trans or non-binary children and make them a target of stigma, harassment, or violence. Discriminatory bathroom policies are also impact a child's mental health. Adolescence is a fraught emotional time anyway, and having a body that doesn't match your identity can make it even more stressful. Imagine being a girl and being forced to use the boy's bathroom, or being a boy and being forced to use the girl's bathroom. You can imagine how hurtful that would be and how difficult and how that would make you a target as well. 
The, the Trevor Project had a, a 2022 national survey on LGBTQ youth mental health and found that 45% of LGBTQ, ser, LGBTQ youth seriously considered attempting suicide in the past year, including more than half of transgender and non-binary youth. More than half considered suicide. Um, and 59% of black transgender and non-binary youth reported considering suicide with one in four attempting suicide in the past year. So I, I ask you to please ignore the, the minority who are pushing for discriminatory bathroom policies and, and please do the right thing and allow children um, to be their authentic selves. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other elected officials that wish to speak? Okay, I do you see Delegate Forbes, so thank you for being here um, tonight. Okay. I will now call on our school system affiliated groups to speak, and our first speaker is, is Sane Ryan from the Baltimore County Junior Councils and the Baltimore, right, the Baltimore County Junior Councils. And did I say your name correctly? Son, okay. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Son. Good evening. Good evening. Hello, everyone. I'm Son Ryan. I'm an eighth grader at Dumbarton Middle School, and I'm the chair of BCJC, the Baltimore County Junior Councils. We are a student run organization that represents the middle schools in Baltimore County. I would like to start this speech by emphasizing that BCJC strongly believes in promoting inclusivity and ensuring that the rights of every student are respected and protected. We strive to create a safe and welcoming environment where all individuals, regardless of their identity or background, feel safe, supported, and heard. I'm here to update the board about what has been happening in BCJC. So far this year, BCJC has had one executive board meeting, which was in September. These meetings are where our members collaborate on projects, give reports, plan events, and learn even more leadership skills. We have our October executive board meeting tomorrow, which the BCJC officer team has been preparing for these past couple of weeks. BCJC and BCSE are also preparing for our workshop presenting training, which will be in conjunction with MASC, the Maryland Association of Student Councils. Students who Students who attend this workshop presenter training will become certified by MASC and BCSC, and we will be able to present at both of those organizations' events. Most of our goals for this year involve expanding school participation. BCJC is a fairly new organization, so we want to ensure that all middle schoolers know about opportunities in BCJC and beyond. This year, we have 14 members who represent nine different BCS middle schools, including the virtual learning program. This has almost doubled the amount of middle schools represented last year. We are also working to expand school participation through our general assemblies, which are both in-person and virtual. At these assemblies, our BCSC slash BCJC certified presenters teach secondary school student council members leadership skills, such as speech writing, engaging an audience, identifying implicit bias, and more. We would like to see representatives from every BCPS middle school throughout the year, and we are going to work on this by reaching out to school student councils. We are also working on expanding BOSS, the board of selected students. BOSS meets monthly on Google Meets and has discussions about how to make our school system better for students. If there are middle schools without BOSS representatives, we will reach out to them to see if they have any interested students. It has been a productive school year thus far, and we are eager to see what the rest of the school year will hold. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Our next speaker is Julia Hemler, also from the Baltimore County Junior Council. Good evening. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Julia Hemler, and as you, I'm also a member of the Baltimore County Junior Council. School is supposed to be a safe place to learn, but how can you learn when you don't feel safe? According to GLSEN, the Gay, Lesbian, Straight Education Network, on average, an LGBTQ student will hear 26 anti-LGBTQ slurs every day, one third of which come from a school staff member. 
Derogatory terms like the that I can't say here being normalized in everyday conversation, many people don't even know what these words mean or how detrimental hearing this can be to an LGBTQ person's mental health. Homophobic or transphobic language isn't okay, and people should know this. Schools can help by providing more awareness and consequences for using these words to students and staff. School support like this will make a big difference to someone already struggling with coming out. Another issue for LGBTQ youth in the school system is the gender-specific bathrooms. According to the 2015 U.S. Trans Survey released by the National Center for Transgender Equality, 59% of transgender people reported that they had avoided bathrooms in the past year because of, um, in f for fear of confrontation. 8% reported getting a kidney or urinary tract infection because of avoiding public restrooms. If people are getting hurt over this, it's a sign that things need to change. Adding general neutral bathrooms not um, just as an option would greatly improve many transgender or non-binary youth's learning environment. After all, if you can't even go to the bathroom, how are you going to be able to focus on your schoolwork? All of this comes down to school support. One of the most important things you can do when it comes to comfort in, within the school environment is adding a safe place. According to GLSEN, in one study, they found that 28% of LGBTQ youth dropped out of school due to peer harassment. If you let everyone know where to find a staff member or place that is a safe space where they can be respected, then school will really be a place that everyone can feel comfortable learning in. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Ramona Basillo from the PTA Council of Baltimore County. Good evening. Good evening, everyone. It's a tough act to follow. <laughs> Good evening, um, members of the board, Superintendent Rogers. I greet you on behalf of the PT Council, PTA Council of Baltimore County, and also members of students who are working throughout the Baltimore County school system on Kindness Week. Kindness Week is set up for next week, Mind Over Matters, Anti-Bullying. Their themes are profound, civility, equity, unity, kindness, respect, and positivity, a message that we hope that we all here in this room will remember. I also greet you on behalf of our president of our PTA Council. The PTA is over 125 years old. It is the largest and the oldest volunteer child advocacy group in the nation. It has survived through the Civil Rights Movement, through Jim Crow, <laughs> through desegregation, and has stood, stood side by side with allies throughout the country in support of children and protecting children with one voice. I come to you today with the weight of 111,000 children on your heads and in your heart and say to you that like the National PTA Council, protect, protect, protect our gay, lesbian, transgender and bisexual youth. I want to share with you that in much the same way that many of those students and members of the community are harassed, are pointed out, are humiliated, are being confused today, it wasn't too long ago that a child, a person like me, couldn't go to a bathroom in a place called Hutzler's Department Store downtown. And I am not that old. And I wondered why. It has occurred to me that there are children today who are falling victim to that same thought. Why am I treated differently? Why did, I won't say his name, a young boy who got harassed and bullied at school and was called the F word, went home, told his dad, his dad beat him again. He dropped out of school in the, <coughs> in the 12th grade. I wonder why a young woman and her mother had to be taken to the hospital 
and somebody held the hand of that mother when her daughter died. And as her daughter died on the ground, she was called a dyke. That woman was my mother, and that girl was my sister. I say to you, protect our children. Thank you. Thank you. Next are our unions, and our first speaker is Helen Groves um, from TAPCO on behalf of Cindy Sexton. Good evening. Good evening, Chair Lichter, Superintendent Rogers, and board members. Thank you for the opportunity to address you this evening on behalf of the Teachers Association of Baltimore County. A small group recently has requested that the board re-examine guidance influencing policies affecting LGBTQIA students and staff. In my roles on the TABCO Board of Directors and as an early childhood special educator, I have the privilege of regularly conversing and interacting with families, students, and educators in diverse schools. I can assure you that, while extremely vocal, this group's opinions are not representative of the majority of your stakeholders across the county. As a special educator, I am charged with advocating for students and families while adhering to applicable federal and state laws and policies. With that in mind, here are a few guiding principles related to the rights of trans and non-binary binary students. On a federal level, Title IX protects students from discrimination based on sex, including sexual orientation and gender identity. Despite these protections, a 2023 study found that a majority of LGBTQ students in high schools reported verbal harassment due to sexuality or gender. MSDE published guidelines for inclusion and non-discrimination for trans and non-binary students, prioritizing a safe and supportive school environment that minimizes stigmatization, protects all students, and does not single out students by gender. Seven years after this study, only half of the students surveyed found their school to be gender affirming. In 2023, 56% of LGBTQ students were unable to access appropriate mental health care as self-reported. Maryland Governor Wes Moore signed an executive order last spring recognizing the unique health care needs of trans individuals, proclaiming to all LGBTQIA plus Marylanders, you deserve to be your authentic selves, to live safely, openly, and freely. We know that data shows that all students feel a greater sense of safety and community when they are welcomed in their environment. In 2020, members of this board signed Resolution 2022-01, affirming the board supports the decisions of students for gender expression, including accommodations for the use of school facilities corresponding to the gender they consistently identify. TABCO supports educators as we advocate for the protections and rights of all students and staff members. We recognize a sense of great urgency to continue advocating for those most susceptible to becoming victims of harm due to their gender or sexual identity. You've heard the statistics already this evening. Board members, in reviewing the guidance documents, the data clearly shows a continued need to enrich our policies and practices to embrace diversity, equity, and inclusivity for all students and staff within BCPS. Thank you. Next are our nonprofit community groups, and our first speaker is Clarissa Taylor Jackson from the NPHC Metropolitan Baltimore. Good evening. I'm just a little pregnant, so. <laughs> <laughs> Good evening, Madam Chair, Madam Vice, and Madam Superintendent, and the entire board. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to come before you once again. Every once in a while, I come before you on behalf of the National Pan-Hellenic Council, 
Metropolitan Baltimore, um, for those of you who don't know, it's the Divine Nine, the nine historically black uh, Greek fraternities and sororities who are operating in your county. But not only that, we are in your schools teaching your students. We are after school and you're out of school time being with your children, providing support on the PTAs um, with, to your students and just to the school in general and to your lovely principals and admin. And I'm here once again just to remind you of a few things that we do. Um, specifically, our fraternities spend a lot of time trying to, actually all of our fraternities and sororities spend a lot of time trying to mentor students going into the schools when invited, obviously, um, mentoring your students, also providing supplies for your teachers. Um, what is more, going back to the PTA piece, I'm glad that we're hearing from the PTA. Um, our, we get requests all the time from schools, um, particularly PTAs, asking for a little, just extra support, especially in the times that we live in right now, um, where all the guidance in the whole wide world is necessary, especially for little black and brown kids. Um, and so I am happy to report among the over a thousand members of the NPHC who are living and working and serving in Baltimore County and who belong to the chapters that are op operating in Baltimore County. They literally are answering the call. So we might dress up in our colors and we might step and stroll and be very loud. Um, but nevertheless, we stand for our children because once upon a time, we were those same kids looking up to any adult who would give us the time of day. And so we are trying to do more than that now. And I just wanted to remind you all that we are here. We will eternally be here in support of this district, this leadership, and of course, the kids. Thank you. Our next speaker is Danielle Smith from Black Women for Positive Change. Okay. Our next speaker is Zaneda Rowe from the FTC Team Metal Pipe. And did I pronounce your first name incorrectly? Um, it's Zenaida. Zenaida. Oh. Good evening. Good evening. Um, good evening to the chair, vice chair, superintendent, and members of the board. My name is Zenaida Rowe, and I'm here representing the FTC team number 23741. My friend Arya Kazemnia spoke here at the last board meeting about interdisciplinary STEM. I'm here tonight to talk about magnet programs. I have been in magnet programs my entire career as a BCPS student. I'm now a senior at Camden High School in the International Baccalaureate Magnet Program. However, at Cromwell Elementary School is where I began in the STEM magnet program. Attending this school and being educated in various STEM subjects had a profound impact on me. I would not be where I am today without them strewn parts across a table. A mess? No, a canvas. The beginning of my journey, a new window that I could see, an infinite world ahead of me, hours spent rehearsing our presentation regarding STEM education. I know that it may have been a naive view, but that very program instilled within me the values of finding play in progress and furthermore, finding solutions in adversity. I'm here with my friends tonight, who I met through the STEM program at Cromwell. Our shared interest in building the tech of the future has brought us together. None of this would have been possible without the BCPS STEM magnet program at Cromwell Valley Elementary. Magnet programs provide a unique opportunity for students to study their interests and help them in their exploration of future careers. However, in this, in this county, we have neglected one area, STEM. STEM is the future of our economy and we must recognize that. To prepare our students for the future, we must give them ample resources to explore their interests in STEM in the present. I am ranked second in my class, and I firmly believe this is because I was in a magnet program early on, and also that it was a STEM one. And yet, even now, there is talk of removing that magnet program from Cromwell Elementary School. This cannot happen. We already have a void to fill in terms of STEM magnet programs, with only two elementary schools, five middle schools, and 13 high schools with STEM magnet programs currently. Now is the time, 
Now is not the time to neglect this matter. Swift action needs to be taken to bring more STEM magnet programs to our students at all levels. If STEM is the future, then our students will be sorely left in the past due to our neglect if we do not act now. Thank you. Our next speaker is Lynn Lawings from the Baltimore County Chapter of Continental Societies, Inc. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening, board chair. Good evening, board members. Good evening, um, Dr. Rogers. Um, my name is Lynn Lawings, and I am the president of Baltimore County uh, Chapter of Continental Societies here along with my Continental Sisters. The mission of the Continental Society and the Baltimore County Chapter is to create environments within our communities that empower children to have access to quality and appropriate opportunities to reach their operable potential. The Baltimore County program year starts 20, started September 2023. And we are excited about initiatives, National African American Reading, Literacy Development, Thanks to the late Dr. Jerry Cobb Scott, Scott, who was, it was her brainchild idea to create the National African American Read-In to become a part of Black History Month, which is in February. Dr. Cobb's vision was for all of us to see ourselves in books. This initiative has reached more than six million participants around the world. The program encouraged students to read books written by African-American authors. During the COVID pandemic, the Baltimore County participated. We created a virtual library project, an African-American read-in throughout the United States, 49 chapters we have throughout the United States. And we all dressed in the costumes of the stories, and we videotaped all the chapters, and we participated in a recording, and then we set up a link to send to schools, community centers, daycares, and the link ran from February the 4th to March 3rd, just to keep the initiative of reading with all our children. The Baltimore County is proud um, to continue this national initiative in February with literacy and development at, for the Baltimore County Schools. Our children, our commitment, our concern. And right now, some of my members are at the Featherbed Elementary participating in a Hispanic half Heritage African, I mean, Heritage Health Wellness. And we have members there, and we have uh, documents in Spanish and in English just to keep our initiatives going forward. Our children, our commitment, our concern. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Gloria Marrow from the Highlanders. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening again, Superintendent Dr. Rogers and board members. There are many challenges to our Board of Education, to the schools that they oversee. In a climate of socio-political discord, changes and differences, which all of us are experiencing or witnessing today, many individuals in our socio-political environment are forcing the board to be able to navigate some arbitrary and abusive groups and individuals who will and may be have come to voice negative opinions about such matters as school security, a diversified and equitable educational program in our different schools programs and curriculum, about teacher recruitment and retention, and or racial and gender diversities. These are challenges that create multiple problems and situations for the operations of our schools and for the board. We hope outside influences along with the old line traditional and unresolved prejudice can and will be made difficult to get into our schools. We must keep in mind that there must be equity and a genuine acceptance and understanding of the racial, social, and human diversities 
which now exist in our schools, in our school parameters, in our classrooms, and otherwise. They certainly are alive in this general society. Only in our school classrooms can acceptance and understanding of differences can be understood and nourished by using appropriate teaching tools, teaching with an open mind, and moving toward the acceptance of differences to promote positive learning and interaction for and by the learners. Times have changed. The arc of democracy is still bending forward. Our observers, parents, students, and others must find acceptance and apply themselves to different and meaningful socio-political arenas. We cannot go back to the old ways. Thank you. Thank you. Next are individual citizens and student groups, and our first speaker is Eileen Trong. Good evening. Good evening, everybody. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Eileen, and I have three children in Baltimore County. I didn't bring a written speech today, but I'm going to begin with a quote that I saw one of our board members posted on her page, and it goes like this. Silence is a foundation of complacency. Use your voice. So imagine a group of 11 or 12 year old girls complain to their athletic director or principal that it's unfair for them to have to run or swim against a male athlete who say he feels like a girl. They are also concerned about the lack of female privacy when having to use the locker room with this male student. The school or the principal or the athletic director may sympathize with the girl's valid concern and reasoning, but they have to follow the board policy. So now the girls come to you looking for a logical explanation. What are you going to tell them? Are you going to tell them that this policy is non-negotiable and that their basic human rights, the rights to sex equality, the right to fairness in sport, the right to have safe female space at school are no longer in existence, and that their feeling and concern are now seconds to a male who say he feel like a girl. Now, by parents suggesting that there are safety risks associated with this policy, we are not saying that trans students are dangerous. As a matter of fact, these risks are written on and acknowledged by the policy itself. Now, if, if we ask that all students to have the opportunity to participate in sport but have to be on the team aligned with their biological sex, does not deprive the students from identifying any genders he or she wanted. And if you may not know, there are more than two genders. Genders are now fluid, endless. There's students that identify agender, cis uh, or non-binary, so where do they belong? Now, if you continue with this policy, I mean, this policy does not reflect inclusive, equality, or anything. It actually does the opposite. And um, most importantly, it's rob our females their most basic human rights. So what are you going to do? If you continue with this, you are showing the message to the community that the school is no longer a place to educate, teach critical thinking, fact, science, common sense, but rather acts as a vehicle that push an agenda and ideologies that only benefit self-interest. I thank you for my time. Our next speaker is Bash Farone. Good evening. Good evening to all. Special thanks to Delegate Ruth and Delegate Pastor and all others who have spoken for equality, equity, diversity. The agenda meetings are becoming shorter. So I really wonder whether you, the Board of Education, 
are abdicating your duties to, delegate, to um, debate and discuss, um, I, I don't understand why they are short. One teacher, PTA member, TABCO member, calendar committee member, basically uh, advertised for stand for Israel. Now, everybody has the freedom of choice. I have it, everybody have it. But my worry is, what are the school teachers teaching our students? So I want to remind you, it took me and my friend, Muhammad Jamil, 25 years from Dr. Berger time to convince the Board of Education for equal holidays. And it took the Board of Education five extra years to codify that principle in a policy. Why is that? Because there is a built-in discrimination in the system. The system, the way I see it from my vantage, is about blacks and whites. It's about Jews and Christians. But Baltimore County has dozens of religions and have, I don't know, a hundred ethnicities, all immigrants, national origin. Why just focus on one religion, two, one color or two, all right? That is my take. We stand to that flag, all right? Which means all of us, it should not really be that a Jewish superintendent like Dr. Berger comes in and advocate only for the Jewish holidays as he did some 30 plus years ago. It shouldn't be that a black superintendent advocate only for blacks. It shouldn't be somebody who is Hindu advocating for Indian matters. It should be all about us, all the colors behind me, all the religions behind me. And no teacher in the school system needs to teach students false history about Israel and Arabs, none should be complete disqualification. Your focus should be on education. Ford makes many cars. We make only one product, graduating students who are educated, who are ready to lead the whole world. Thank you. Not to be discriminatory, not to send our new boys Thank you, Ms. Dr. Farone. Thank you for your comments. Our next speaker is Fergal Mullaly. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, we'll just switch it. Okay, he's coming up. Good evening. Good evening, Madam Chair, Vice Chair, Board Members. My name is Fergal Mullaly. I'm a parent of two children in Baltimore County Public Schools. I regret that I must further distract you from more pressing and important business in the education of our students to discuss the protest outside. The delegates Pasteur, Delegate Root, and a number of other people have spoken on these facts uh, much more effectively and eloquently than I could, so I want to restrict myself to just one personal perspective. The self-described group of concerned parents outside do not speak for this parent. They don't speak for my children. In fact, they don't speak for my, f my family or any of the families that I've talked about this. They're outside shouting about protecting all children, and Lord knows my children need protection from an awful lot of things. The list is endless, but transgender kids are not on that list. Not in the classroom, not in the bathroom, not on the sports field. Board policy places inclusion and equity among the foundational educational goals. And I thank you all for your continued efforts to make sure that every f child feels welcome in our schools. Thank you very much. Thank you. Our next speaker is Roa Hassan, our former student board member. Okay. Our next. She's virtual? Okay. Sorry, Ms. Hassan. Ms. Hassan, I think you might be muted.
can I go to the next one and then we'll see. They can all hear her. The people online can hear each other, but they can't. <laughs> right, we can't hear them. Do you want me to, do you want to? Thank you everyone for your patience. Putting our new superintendent to the test as she tries to navigate this over here. <laughs> Mrs. Is she calling in? Okay, you're calling in? Okay, yes. We're getting thumbs up and gestures, so that's why we're... we're <laughs> it's not... Not working? Oh, I think she just got on. Okay, we can't... Go ahead.
Thank you. The next speaker is Lloyd Allen. So he's also virtual. Okay. So we're going to give him a minute to leave and come back. Roa, if you still hear me, can you hang up? Thank you. We can't. So what? Mr. Allen, you can speak. Oh, okay, excellent. Uh, hold on a moment, let me get my notes back up. And statement remains. I wonder whether we can offer ASL ourselves. We now have a course number. It's true that implementing a new program from whole cloth would require creativity. I would charge CCBC with examining the requirements for the ASL sequence. And if Accuplacer is in fact required for some students, then it is essential that ECAP publish and advertise procedures for accessing reasonable accommodations, both for that assessment and for the classes. Thank you so much. Have a good evening. Thank you. Next is public comment on the proposed 2024-2025 school calendar. And our first speaker is, is Jeffrey Friedman.
Good Hello, evening. Everybody. Good evening. My name is Jeffrey Friedman, and I'm a veteran BCPS educator. I'm here tonight kindly asking you to adopt a post-Labor Day calendar for the 24 to 25 school year and for every year moving forward. I'm disappointed that any inquiries related to starting after Labor Day next year were quickly dismissed and not brought up again. If you don't consider a post-Labor Day calendar, you are ignoring the majority who have asked for one year after year. Have you considered the members of the calendar committee who have been pushing year after year to start post-Labor Day, whose opinions continue not to be heard? If you ask our bargaining units what their members feel they should do, they will tell you that all or most want to start before Labor Day. But have you truly considered if this was the case or just believed what you heard? Because the most recent survey data states the opposite for all stakeholder groups. And this survey data was shared during the November 9th, 2022 board meeting. In a 2019 survey open to the entire community of over 91,000 people, 64.2% voted for a post-Labor Day start. In 2022, 5,000 BCPS employees voted and 58.8% voted for a post-Labor Day start. By bargaining unit, 81.9% of AFSCME members, 63.7% of CASE members, 69.1% of ESPBC members, 70.2% of OPE members, 52.9% of TAMCO members, and 71% of unrepresented members all voted that they wanted a post-Labor Day start. Our bargaining units will also tell you that we should do what is best for students. If we are doing that, we will also begin after Labor Day, allowing for a full summer and eliminating the constant interruptions weekly to instruction. Starting one week earlier and then breaking for a long weekend has no educational benefit. There are too many non-instructional closings, PD days, half days, and other random closings. These lengthen the year and make it more difficult for our students to learn and retain content. If we want to increase instructional time during the middle of the school year, eliminate the number of closure days. Speaking of lengthening the year, it's important to note that you would likely lose a large number of faculty and staff members should you choose to change to year-round school. So as board members, you're expected to listen to your constituents and vote for what they want. Based on the data already present, they are overwhelmingly asking you to start school after Labor Day. Please listen and vote accordingly this year. Thank you. Thank you. Since there are speaker spaces available, I'm going to now go to the wait list by category. And we had a space open for a nonprofit community group. And the first sign up is Brenda Pfeiffer from the Decoding Dyslexia of Baltimore County. Oh, there you are. <laughs> Thank you. Good evening. Good evening. My name is Brenda Pfeiffer, and I'm speaking tonight on behalf of the Baltimore County Chapter of Decoding Dyslexia Maryland, or DDMD. DDMD is a parent-led movement driven by families concerned about reading instruction and interventions for all students, including those with dyslexia in Maryland public schools. Our local Baltimore County Chapter has had almost a decade of history working with BCPS boards and staff to create positive change in the area of reading instruction for all kids. We advocated for and supported BCPS's initiatives for Bowman's OG plus 60 hour course, open court letters, Wilson Reading System certified teachers, and Hegarty as far as curriculum. On the statewide level, our group was the main driver behind Maryland's ready to read screening law. At the most recent meeting for our chapter attended by parents from all over the county, significant concerns were shared. The most pressing and the one I want to address tonight is Orton Gillingham training. For history's sake, when BCPS was initially looking at OG teacher training, DDMD Baltimore County was adamant that we would only support a contract with a minimum 60 hour training. In fact, we wanted more to include a practicum. Most recently, in August of 2022, BCPS signed a new five year contract for 60 hour OG training. This is the only contract we can find for OG training in the BCPS contracts table, and we are unaware of any training cohorts under this contract since the last one ended in March 2023. While staff assured the board two meetings ago that OG training was ongoing, they failed to inform the board and the public that the training has changed to a different vendor whose OG training course cuts the training hours in half, from 60 hours to only 30. At a time in our system when reading scores have never been more concerning, we find this completely unacceptable. We are being contacted by stakeholders with concerns about this change to the longstanding OG initiative. 
IEP chairs are reporting to DDMD Baltimore County that BCPS Compliance Department is saying that OG is overused and that we need to cut back. Why aren't needs driving services? They should be. We are also concerned by recent disclosures of a lack of any Tier 3 reading interventions at dozens of secondary schools. Staff reported two meetings ago that we have only 32 trained OG teachers to meet the great need at 55 secondary schools. This should be of great concern to this board. In closing, at a time when teachers are looking out into their classrooms into a sea of non-readers, why has the system changed one of the most widely supported literacy endeavors implemented in the last 10 years? We are requesting a response to these concerns, and we hope to work collaboratively with you to improve literacy instruction for all students in BCPS. Thank you, and happy Dyslexia Awareness Month. Thank you. The next speaker for the school calendar from the wait list is Latanya Lamry, and I'm not sure I have your last name right. Okay. The next speaker on the wait list for a calendar is Stephanie Barber. Um, I think the next person signed up twice, Clarissa Taylor Jackson. Um, and Bash Farone for the calendar. Did you want to speak on the calendar? Or did you speak on the calendar? You, you had signed up on the wait list for the calendar. Did you? OK. You can. I really don't have any prepared remarks. So if I make a mistake, you know, you hopefully forgive me. So I have been a member since Dr. Berger. And one point, all the calendar committee meetings from Berger all the way to now, the calendar committee always managed, always managed. Take this, take that, here and there. So. My worry is, I think there are too many days preparation before the school starts. Again, I talked to you about artificial intelligence. I talked to you about automation. I don't really figure out why students have to wait extra five days for the teachers to prepare classrooms. Well, the point is that was quoted in the calendar committee. It takes time. You know, there's always some reason. I think the school calendar has too many days and times off. I think our honorable board member scratched the surface on it last board meeting when she asked about the half days. So my thought to you as a taxpayer about the effectiveness of teaching, all right? Everybody agrees that the more hours and days that the students spend in the school system, the more they learn. But if you look at the calendar, it has too many days off, too many professional days. In the first meeting, no Muslim holidays were put in, and I really don't mind talking about it, I hated it, all right? And somebody told me in the committee that we have too many professional days. But in the same and next meeting, TAPCO added professional day extra, and everybody accepted it without even a question. Not even one single question. So what am I saying to you? Your product is only graduating students that can meet the world. You cannot do it with too many days off and give him perk for TAPCO and perk for this group and that political group. You got to get rid of all that noise and focus on the students. Focus on the kids. Thank you. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is the superintendent's report, and for that I call on Dr. Rogers. Thank you. Good evening, Chair Lichter, Vice Chair Harvey, members of the board. 
I am pleased to share with you my superintendent's report. Before we begin, I want to thank all of our students who came out this evening, and I want to affirm on behalf of Baltimore County Public Schools our commitment to creating welcoming, safe, and inclusive environments and cultures in all of our schools for all students and staff members in BCPS. Next slide, please. Thank you. Want to share some of the work that we have been doing in uh, reference to academic achievement across Team BCPS. Um, highlights of our recent professional learning. As we have had the opportunity to uh, engage in research of national and international school systems that have made great progress with student achievement, we are aware of a through line that exists in all of those school systems curriculum, professional learning, and PLCs. We have affirmed our commitment to all three areas uh, as a result of uh, contracts that you have approved. We are now in a space where we have high quality curriculum aligned to standards. We just began the rollout of HMH into reading for elementary literacy. Our curriculum in the areas of mathematics and literacy are evidence-based, and part of our work this year is to ensure fidelity of implementation as we move forward. We need to make sure that all of our teachers, paraprofessionals, leaders, and central office staff members have access to high-quality professional learning. Recently, we've had the first central office professional uh, leadership development for our central office professionals. We've also had our principal leadership development where they focused on curriculum, specifically ESOL, literacy, mathematics, and special education. Karen Chenoweth, author and researcher from districts and schools that succeed, also met with our uh, principals and uh, central office professionals to talk about those rapid cycles of school improvement, uh, what is needed to move schools and school systems forward, uh, really focusing on improvement, prioritizing teaching and learning, and making sure that we are dedicating time and resources uh, to meet the needs of our students. And lastly, professional learning communities are necessary in schools and offices to ensure that we have ongoing collaborative cycles of inquiry and action to meet the needs of our students on a regular basis. Next slide. We are excited to announce today uh, the debut of Budget 101 on our school website. All stakeholders uh, may go and find a tab that will take them to Budget 101 as one of our means of engaging with all stakeholders across Team BCPS. In Budget number uh, 101, you will learn all about our budget, how our budget is developed, what drives the budget, our different funding sources, and much more. So we encourage all stakeholders to take a look and share with us uh, feedback. We will continue to add, uh, but it is a robust site that really um, intends to make sure that all stakeholders across Team BCPS understand our budget, the purpose, and how we work together with all of our partners to meet the needs of our students and staff. Next slide, please. Additionally, we have shared with all members of Team BCPS an opportunity to provide direct feedback on our budget. We encourage all stakeholders to participate as the budget does not close until um, the 13th, I believe. And we also invite community members out for community conversations starting this Thursday at Sparrows Point High School, where we will be talking about the priorities for fiscal year 2025 and really giving stakeholders an opportunity to learn about the process and share with us their feedback on priorities for Team BCPS. Lastly, ask that you please join me and thanking and celebrating all of our principals as October is National Principals Month. We appreciate them and all of the hard work um, that they uh, lead in our buildings and school communities on behalf of over 111,000 students each and every day. It is a hard job and they do it very well in service to students. And so we wanna celebrate, celebrate our principals. 
Leslie, I want to thank all members of Team BCPS for continuing to engage with us. We empower you to share uh, your actual feedback with us about how we're doing and ways that we can continue to improve so we can move forward on behalf of our students. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rogers. Um, next on the agenda is Chair's report. Um, I'd like to start my report by wishing a very happy National Principal Appreciation Month to all of our wonderful and dedicated BCPS principals. I was fortunate to have had many positions in BCPS, and while each of these roles gave me an opportunity to positively impact students and families, the role of school principal will always be my favorite position, um, even more than board member. Being able to lead a school to ensure that we are maximizing the potential of our staff and our students was the ultimate privilege. Parents and guardians put their most prized possession under my watch each day. They put their children on the bus, drove them in a car, or walked them to the front door. They said goodbye, and then they trusted me and my staff to make certain that their children were safe, secure, and learning. From welcoming students each morning to interacting with students in their classrooms to assisting teachers in perfecting their craft to picking up trash in the cafeteria to countless lunch bunches, I loved being a principal. And I know I speak for so many, including our superintendent. Once a principal, always a principal. I also had the privilege of supporting principals in their role as building leaders. I know that the words I am sharing about the job of principal is felt by our BCPS principals. They relish the role and are committed to their school communities. I also know just how hard they work and how consuming the position is. As a principal, you think about the work 24-7. Whether you're in the car, in the shower, waking up in the middle of the night, or on your vacation, um, you are thinking about your school and the work that needs to be done. Your goal is your educators and your students' success. Nothing is more important. But the work is hard. It's very hard, it's very consuming, and at times it's very lonely. Yet day after day, our principals do the work. They pour over data, they consult with colleagues, they put ideas into practice, all for the betterment of their students. And for this, we, the Board of Education, are grateful. We thank you, we appreciate you, value you, and we celebrate you this month and every day of the school year, or the whole year, not just school year. Next, I'd like to touch on recent discussions and public comments about guidelines, policies, and supports for the LGBTQIA students. In an effort to level set and ensure we all have a clear understanding of what policies are and what the process looks like in BCPS, it's important for me to clarify that a policy is a statement of the vision, goals, principles, or position of the Board of Ed to guide and direct the superintendent and the staff. A rule which is issued by the superintendent of schools is to implement the policies of the Board of Education and to establish the matter in which board policies are to be executed. The Board of Education has a policy and a review committee, currently chaired by Ms. Pumphrey, that works on the creation and review of policies. For those of you who regularly watch or attend Board of Ed meetings, and we appreciate you, you see the process of policies being presented, input being provided, changes being made, and approval being given. Once approved by the full board, the superintendent then directs appropriate staff to work on creating the aligned rules which focus on the operations and the implementation of that policy into everyday practice. All of our BCPS board policies and rules can be found on board docs. The very first policy included is policy 0100, our equity policy. This policy was most recently reviewed by the board on September 14th, 2021. And while it was approved by a previous board, its importance and its relevancy are extremely as important as we collectively navigate difficult and complex issues and conversations. I strongly encourage members of the BCPS community to review this policy. It is a very thorough and detailed policy that outlines the philosophy of the Board of Ed and core values for our system. The beginning of the policy reads, the Board of Ed of Baltimore County believe that every student in the school system should receive an education that maximizes his or her potential to become a globally competitive graduate. The board is committed to fostering the success of every student in every school by creating and maintaining environments that are safe, diverse, and inclusive. For success to occur for each student in lifelong learning and the world of work, 
the school system prioritize educational equity by recognizing and removing institutional barriers and ensuring that social identifiers are not obstacles. Raising achievement for all students and closing achievement gaps among our students are the top priorities of the board. Achieving equity means implicit biases and students' identities will neither predict nor predetermine their success in school. Disparities on the basis of race, special education status, gender, ethnicity, sexual orientation, gender identity, including gender expression, English language status, immigration status, or socioeconomic status are unacceptable and are directly at odds with the belief that all students can achieve. While complex societal and historical factors contribute to the inequities our students face, rather than perpetuating disparities, the school system must address and overcome inequity by providing all students with the opportunity to succeed. The words each and every are used repeatedly in this policy because we are committed to all BCPS students. We are committed to creating conditions that foster inclusivity and welcoming learning environments for all. I commend the previous board who had the courage to create and approve policy 0100 and implore our current board and community to keep the beliefs in the policy in the forefront of decision making. Thank you. And next on our agenda is our student members report and for that I call Ms. Drummond. First and foremost, First and foremost, I wanted to speak regarding the LGBTQIA plus comments circulating, circulating by saying we should continue to speak about these individuals as the equals they are. Is there a microphone on? Let's bring it it's, closer. It's green. Let's bring it closer and louder. Talk louder. Okay. First and foremost, I wanted to speak regarding the LGBTQIA plus comments circulating by saying they should we should all continue to speak about these individuals as the equals they are and not by discounting their needs and wants and experiences just because it may not be something that everyone agrees with. We all should keep the treat others how you would want to be treated saying in the back of our minds. No matter the thoughts you have on the subject and in, in inclusivity resolution, everyone, every one of our students deserves to be treated with the basic human decency and respect. With Baltimore County being one of the largest and most diverse districts in the state, you must keep in mind that not everyone will be satisfied with each decision made by the board. Thank you to the students who came prepared with, this, with a speech. You are, who we vote, you are who we vote for. So even if they don't want to listen, make everyone hear your voice. Moving forward, those hoping for a reduction of half and off days should keep in mind not only the education of our students, but the mental health of them mental health of them and understanding that they are young minds still figuring out the world and not and how to official efficiently navigate it. Believing that the more schools students have, the more they learn, or the more, more proficient they are, is not true. For many students, five-day school weeks are just before the breaking point. We want students to be well-rounded, correct? Getting rid of the half and off days would add more weight to students in five-day-a-week five, in five -week sports, once-a-week clubs, etc. Having full or half or half off days give students a very hard, very hard earned break. Having days being used mostly as makeup days are extraordinarily useful for students, giving them time to catch up on work and improving their grades. Furthermore, half and off days should not be reduced because more, because more school means more learning. Because more school means more learning, when more learning means nothing if students aren't mentally present. On a lighter note, I plan to begin school visits in order co to connect with students and more to connect with students more so and have information based on a collective student perspective. Also, in the near future, we'll be holding town small town hall meetings to share and receive information. Thank you. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is unfinished business, consideration of board policies. This is the second reader for this policy, and for that I call Ms. Christina Pumphrey, Chair of the Policy Review Committee. Thank you. Members of the board, the Policy Review Committee asks that the board accept the committee's recommendation to amend the following board policies. Board Policy 1100, Community Relations, Communications with the Public, Board Policy 4100, Personnel, Conduct, Employee Conduct and Responsibilities, and Board Policy 5200, Students, Promotion and Retention. 
These policies are presented to you on tonight's agenda as Exhibit J. May I have a motion to accept the recommendation of the Board's Policy Review Committee for Board Policies 1100, 4100, and 5200? So moved from Pong. Thank you. No second is needed since the recommendation comes from the committee. Is there any discussion? May I have a roll call vote, please? Ms. Dominowski? Yes. Mr. Young? Yes. Ms. Frempong? Yes. Ms. Stoluski? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Ms. Harvey? Yes. Ms. Drummond? Yes. Ms. Pumphrey? Yes. Dr. Savoy? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Booker Dwyer? Yes. Ms. Lichter? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is action taken in closed session, and for that I call on Mr. Burns. Good evening. Good evening. Madam Chair, Dr. Rogers, members of the board, uh, at this time it would be appropriate for the board to affirm the personnel action approved in closed session in accordance with policy 2310. May I have a motion to approve the action taken in closed session on September 26, 2023 regarding a personnel matter related to policy 2310? So moves Stoluski. Thank you. Second. Is there a second? Second, Savoy. Thank you. Any discussion? May I have a roll call vote, please? Ms. Dominowski? Yes. Mr. Young? Yes. Ms. Frempong? Yes. Ms. Stoluski? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Ms. Harvey? Yes. Ms. Drummond? Yes. Ms. Pumphrey? Yes. Dr. Savoy? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Booker Dwyer? Yes. Ms. Lichter? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Also, this time, it would be appropriate for the board to affirm the actions taken during closed session following oral arguments in hearing examiner cases HE 23-36 and HE 23-17. May I have a motion to affirm the actions taken during closed session following oral arguments on hearing examiner cases HE 2336 and HE 23-17 and authorize Ms. Gover to sign for those board members not physically present. So move Stoluski. Thank you. Is there a second? Second from Pong. Thank you. Any discussion? May I have a roll call vote, please? Ms. Dominowski? Yes. Mr. Young? Yes. Ms. Frempong? Yes. Ms. Stoluski? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Ms. Harvey? Yes. Ms. Drummond? Yes. Ms. Pumphrey? Yes. Dr. Savoy? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Booker Dwyer? Yes. Ms. Lichter? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, board. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is contract awards, and for that I call Ms. Harvey, Chair of the Building Contracts Committee. Thank you, Madam Chair. Members of the board, the board's Building and Contracts Committee met on Monday, October 9, 2023. Items L1 through L19 are being forwarded to the full board for approval. Do I have a motion to approve items L1 through L19? So moves to Lusky. Thank you. No second is needed since the recommendation comes from the committee. Any discussion? Yes, Ms. Dominowski? Yes, could we pull um, L1 for discussion and vote on the, yes. the rest of them? So, do I have a motion to approve items L2 through L19? So moved, Pumphrey. Thank you. Is, um, no, is there a second? Second, Stoluski. Thank you. Any discussion on L2 through L19? May I have a roll call vote, please? Ms. Dominowski? Yes. Mr. Young? Yes. Ms. Frempong? Yes. Ms. Stoluski? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Ms. Harvey? Yes. Ms. Drummond? Yes. Ms. Pumphrey? Yes. Dr. Savoy? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Booker Twyer? Yes. Ms. Lichter? Yes. Thank you. Do I have a motion to approve item L1? So, so moved. moved. No second is needed. Any discussion? Ms. Dominowski, would you like to start since you? Yes. I don't know if, um, if, oh, if, sta if staff wants to come forward okay. or talk. Yes. 
You want to ask the question and then we'll... Yeah. Yeah, go ahead and ask the question. Dr. Dina Nato, Ms. Shea, you can come uh, forward. I, I know we went through this already a lot during curriculum committee, um, but there's some concerns. Our presentation wasn't uploaded to us prior to the, the meeting, and then it was given to us during the meeting. We weren't told how much you guys were asking for additionally, and I'm concerned that the the original spending authority was $10 million and we're only a few months into this contract and you're asking for $5 million more for, and I'm, I'm just quoting what you guys have said, for um, cards and books, like uh, reading book manuals. And I'm sure it's more than that, but that wasn't detailed in your, requ your request. So could you speak to more why it's an additional, basically 50% more of the contract? Ms. Dominowski, as the team comes forward, I will just call attention to uh, page three of the um, exhibit for L1, um, specifically where you can uh, see the justification for increase that speaks to um, providing access to grade level content for students in our public separate day schools. Um, uh, that we um, support our integrated service delivery model, so that's special education uh, for our younger learners, uh, variability in enrollment, multi-grade level programs, um, as just uh, some of the justification for the increased uh, request for uh, spending. At this time, I'll turn it over to the team to provide additional uh, details uh, to respond to Ms. Dominowski's question. Sure. So one of the things that we explained during curriculum committee is the difference between the actual spending from the operating budget and spending authority. And that there are a lot of variables that go into spending. So that the spending authority allows lots of different groups within the school system to make purchases. So if the Office of Title I wants to purchase supplemental materials, they're able to do that, but their purchase goes against the contract, which then takes away the ability for the curricular office to reorder materials or to get those supplemental materials or to um, make adjustments when, and Dr. Uh, Rogers spoke to our, our special education regional program. So some of those classes are multi-grade level classes. A curriculum teacher's guide is ordered for the predominant grade level. As enrollment in those programs fluctuates throughout the course of a school year, students move or transition. We want to have students actually using the curriculum content and the teacher having the book that it's associated with the grade level that they're teaching. All the materials are available online to teachers. They can see the other grade level books. However, most teachers want a teacher's guide. They can write in it. They put post-it notes in it. They, you know, jot down things that they need to follow up and ask. Um, so we believe that material is important for teachers to have. And just to add, yes, thank you for that. And just to add to that, um, it's also about professional learning. So the original contract of the 10 million included professional learning for the first two years. And so you'll see itemized on page three of the exhibit. This is also to make sure that we have funding in the spending authority. Again, to Dr. DiDonato's point, doesn't mean that we'll necessarily spend the five million over the next five years, but we're trying to create the authority so that we are poised to continue our investment in professional learning in years three through five of the implementation. Um, and then, so, so some of what we talked in, about in curriculum committee were just some of the specific materials that schools are requesting to purchase right now. So that's where we detailed things like the vocabulary cards supporting our multilingual learners and some of the supplemental resources like the writer's notebook and that um, read and respond journal, the know it, show it. But long term, over the next five years, um, specifically what Dr. Dina referenced, um, t teachers that move grade levels, while overall enrollment shifts may um, happen in the system, when you support uh, learners in those integrated service delivery models, again, you may purchase multiple grade levels for the same classroom to make sure that students that are serviced in a multi-age group have access to their grade level content. We also found that when we did the initial purchase, we purchased a set of printed materials for resource staff, so reading specialists, special educators, staff development teachers. Many schools, as part of their service um, in trying to provide differentiated support in some of our CSI schools and some of our Title I schools, want to provide um, multiple sets to multiple teams so that they can work with multiple grade levels concurrently. So yes, it's additional supplemental materials like those we talked about in curriculum committee, but the potential spending authority is also to give us the opportunity for ongoing professional learning, increased um, teacher grade level materials, as well as those supplemental materials that might be purchased with grant funds like Dr. DiDonato described. 
Okay, we kind of talk, touched on this in the committee too, as far as, so where's the accountability with these purchases? How many of these are um, one-time purchases? How many things are these going to be, you know, we need to refill, restock, buy again? And how are we um, weighing what works and what doesn't so that we're not making the same mistakes over and over again and buying curriculums that aren't working? So I can speak to the purchasing process for Title I schools as well as um, community schools. Those all have, go through a multi-level approval process, so it's not only the school principal approving them, the Office of Title I approves and reviews those. Um, so there's a multi-level, and there's documentation required for those. So if they're using it as a material that will be given to parents at a parent engagement event, so let's say they're ordering extra vocabulary cards, all of that has to be documented in their resources that they submit to Title I for the justification of per of the purchase. So they know how many families attended the event, how many sets of cards might have been given out. Um, so they, they require a sufficient amount, a, a extensive amount of documentation for um, our Title I schools and community schools who purchase those materials. As far as the, you know, understanding what works. When you buy a program that has lots of parts and pieces, lots of different things are going to influence a student's ability and making progress with something. So overall, we can talk about, you know, do we think it was the vocabulary cards that made the absolute difference with the student's learning? In the end, it's going to be the teacher practices and pedagogy and the way that they're working with students that's going to make the ultimate difference. Those resources might make it easier for the teacher to do that, may make it easier for the student to acquire something because they might have something tangible in their hands versus like looking at something online. So the exact one thing that will make the difference, I think in the end, what we'll see over time is our student's overall test score and reading achievement change. And so that that upside down triangle that we showed you several weeks ago will no longer look like that. That will be the ultimate measure. And as far as I, I believe you're right, as far as teachers um, teaching the curriculum correctly, how are we ensuring that they're getting that? I, I know we're, we're investing in that, we're giving them the time, but in the end, like, how do we really make that accountability for all of our teachers to understand that it's we work together, like this curriculum, we need you guys to understand how to teach it so that our kids can learn too. Right. I, I was just gonna piggyback on, um, because you're right, and thank you for framing it that way, because we know the teacher is the deciding factor. Um, we're trying to also transition from training versus professional learning. So we started with training. Training is how does all this work? What are all the different parts? Learning all the materials. Ongoing professional learning has to be in classrooms. We have to be, we are going with um, principals on leadership walks, training principals to be able to give feedback so that they can, um, both the superintendent and the chair talked about principals month and what a critical role they play. Investing in our leaders so that they can give uh, feedback to teachers about that teacher practice is a critical part of our work that we're doing every month in our principal leadership development. Partnering with the Department of Schools and the executive directors. We also are training our reading specialists and our staff development teachers and part of the professional learning with HMH, which is unique to this contract, is we actually are bringing consultants into schools, doing model lessons and creating PLCs with clusters of schools working together. Um, so that the expectation is the curriculum is that floor, that's the baseline and materials, but the teacher practice and what are those strong models of instruction, the professional learning communities that help support teachers with planning, and then how are we training our leaders to be able to provide that actionable feedback for the integrity of implementation. Um, it's with that close partnership between CNI and Department of Schools and investing in leaders to be able to give that real time feedback that we believe we can change that practice. Thank you very much. Other questions or comments about L1? Okay. May I have a roll call vote, please? Ms. Dominowski? Yes. Mr. Young? Yes. Ms. Frempong? Yes. Ms. Stolesky? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Ms. Harvey? Yes. Ms. Drummond? Yes. Ms. Pumphrey? Yes. Dr. Savoy? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Booker Dwyer? Yes. Ms. Lichter? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, let me just scroll through all these contracts. There was quite a number of them. <laughs> um, while I'm scrolling, Dr. Jones and Dr. Grimm can make their way to the table. Oh, 
Okay, so the next item on the agenda is new business, special project request, and for that we have Dr. Jones and Dr. Grimm. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening, Board Chair Lichter, Vice Chair Harvey, and Dr. Rogers, Superintendent. I am Raquel Jones, um, and I'm here with my colleague, Dr. Jess Grimm. We come before you asking for consideration of a privately funded capital project for Made and Choice um, School. Made and Choice was identified as having a significant need for where students who attend the school could focus on functional learning activities. The addition of a kitchen and laundry area in the newly developed vocational center at the school will provide students with significant special needs ample opportunities to attain new skills in these areas. The student benefit is immeasurable, and we believe that having the kitchen and the laundry room on site will significantly impact students' lives, both individually and in the workplace. This initiative provides an authentic experience that will provide our students with continuous learning to enhance their independence when they exit BCPS. Um, on another note, we believe that being able to consistently practice, learn, and develop newly attained skills allows us to equitably prepare our students at Made in Choice for the world outside of BCPS. So at this time, we'd like to recommend that the Board of Education review and approve Project 7330, the addition of a kitchen and laundry area to the Vocation Center located at Made in Choice School. May I have a motion to approve the privately funded capital project for a kitchen and laundry skills area at Maiden, Maiden so Choice School? Moved. Um, thank you, Ms. Harvey. Is there a second? Second, okay. Pumphrey. Thank you. Any discussion? Mr. McMillian. Oh, sorry. Good evening. Good evening. Obviously, this is important. Why aren't we funding this through the capital project budget? and using this money, I'm not sure of the group that's earned this money and is donating it to us, but if we built that in within our budget and then we use that money in another way for that school, why aren't we doing that? So it's a good question, Mr. McMillian, and actually this 7330, this is the first of two that you'll receive on this project. This uh, particular donation is strictly for cabinetry and appliances being donated by IKEA. So the school has been working through the Education Foundation and with IKEA to provide students with these opportunities um, and learning these skills. Um, IKEA and White Marsh wanted to do something uh, special and specific for the, for the kids. So they wanna donate this equipment. Our staff will then be assessing what it takes to install it and what it takes to properly turn the room over. And then there will be an additional donation that'll come in the form of a 7330 to install both the cabinetry and the appliances once we receive the goods. So he is responsible. They're going to donate the, all the materials. They are donating, they're donating the cabinetry, they're donating the appliances, and they are donating the labor to install a, a num both of those things, but any other work, um, we'll be working through facilities to identify any other needs for the specific classroom. So I can't admit my question was very dumb, so No, it wasn't. It, it, this, oh. is, this is an unusual project <laughs> yes. in that it's being split. Normally we bring the full project to you, um, but the way that uh, IKEA has wanted to handle this particular donation and their timetable, we needed to split it into two. So we needed that we're actually going to accept these goods and services before we've been able to do a full site survey of the rest of the project. So it was actually a very timely question. Thank you very much for explaining that. You're welcome. Ms. Harvey? Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. I really just wanted to make a comment. I've been to Made in Choice. Uh, Made in Choice is a school that's in the district that I represent. And the work that Principal West and her team are doing there is extraordinary. We've had a lot of conversation tonight about equity and inclusion. Uh, and Made in Choice uh, has, uh, is, is a school for children who are differently abled and who have learning challenges and differences. And so this project is exemplary of our commitment as a district, as a school district, to make sure that all of our students are getting a quality and equitable education. And I urge all of my colleagues to wholeheartedly support it. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Harvey. Ms. Booker Dwyer. And so I think this is a, a great idea. I wish more companies would step up and, and do this type of donation. Um, my question is more around the um, sustainability of this. 
So IKEA furniture, um, <laughs> is it going to last with the population of students, knowing how, you know, students, they, when I think about IKEA cabinetry, um, <laughs> Will it will it last? That's that's my first question. And do we have the the staff that can um, upkeep it? So um, I, I don't know that it's under our purview to assess the quality of the cabinetry that that they're donating. What I can tell you is that uh, as part of the seventy three thirty process. Our engineers and architects um, assess the equipment that they want to donate, make sure that it is educationally sufficient. And so uh, as, as part of the process, once we accept the donation as BCPS, we typically accept some level of responsibility in terms of maintenance and upkeep at that point. And the same thing will happen in terms of the appliances that are installed at the facility. Okay. And then is there going to be IKEA branding? So if you think about, you know, the scoreboard that was purchased by Coca-Cola and then there's Coca-Cola everywhere. So is this when we go into the Maiden Choice Kitchen, is it going to be IKEA everywhere? Is it going to be like this brand promotion? That was not a requirement. I, I haven't seen any documentation that would suggest that from them. And, and in fact, they've been extremely low key in, in this donation and this process to date. Okay. Yep. That's all my questions. Thank you. Any further questions or discussion? Yes, Ms. Stileski. Um, but just in light of their very generous donation, it might be really nice to have some kind of little plaque or, um, you know, something in the in the new kitchen area, just thanking them and honoring them for their generous donation. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that recommendation. And we also want to recognize the work of the Education Foundation that actually brought this partnership together. Um, it was through their work that, that this happened in the first place. So I, we agree with you. Yes. Any other questions or comments? May we have a roll call vote, Ms. Gover? Mr. Young? Yes. Ms. Frempong? Yes. Ms. Stileski? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Ms. Harvey? Yes. Ms. Drummond? Yes. Ms. Pumphrey? Yes. Dr. Savoy? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Booker Dwyer? Yes. Ms. Lichter? Yes. Thank you. Don't go anywhere. You too. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that motion passes. The next item on the agenda is the report on infrastructure boundary process update. And, and for that, we have Dr. Grimm and Dr. Jones and Dr. Rogers will begin. Good evening again, board. The purpose of the presentation this evening is to provide everyone with an update regarding our two boundary studies that began uh, last month. Next slide, please. Most recently, members of the Board of Education provided feedback to our team on implementation of our boundary study process. process. Um, some of the feedback spoke directly to making sure that we we're engaging our full community and representing the voice and viewpoints of all communities as we move forward with changing boundaries. Additionally, we also received feedback um, from a variety of stakeholders, uh, including uh, absolutely our Board of Education and families, about Baltimore County taking a uh, forward look at all of our uh, school buildings, looking at capacity, and uh, perhaps uh, taking a more comprehensive approach to address overcrowding uh, issues in our schools. Uh, as everyone is familiar with, when we have uh, overcrowding in schools, uh, two of our long-range options are redistricting in capital projects, meaning additions, new buildings, uh, renovations, and things of, those, of that sort. Uh, based on the feedback that we received, we convened a team of BCPS staff members, including the Department of Communication, Family Engagement, Schools, Equity, Facilities, and Strategic Planning, to name a few, to thoroughly address all of the concerns that were brought forward. Um, as uh, the uh, both our Chief Operating Officer and Chief of Schools will share, um, primary to uh, Superintendent's Rule 1280, uh, our considerations when we are moving forward with a boundary study that we are focusing uh, not only on overcrowding but also focusing on diversity in alignment with um, our equity beliefs and uh, rule, I'm sorry, in policy 0100. So at this time, uh, Dr. Grimm and Dr. Jones will take us through uh, the upgrades to the process and at the end we will open it up to the board members for any questions that you might have. 
Thank you. Next slide, please. As a reminder, boundary changes are covered in Board of Education Policy and Superintendents Rule 1280. It is important to note that this policy and rule are part of the 1000 series, Community Relations, and are in fact part of the Community Involvement subheading. They are not, for example, in the 7000 series of Policies and Rules, Facilities and Construction. Thus, the boundary study process is rooted in community. Through policy 1280, quote, the board recognizes the importance, importance of community involvement in its deliberations and decisions related to school attendance areas, end quote. And the board shall determine with the recommendation of the superintendent the geographical attendance area for each Baltimore County public school. As Dr. Rogers said, to implement policy 1280, rule 1280 states that the boundary study is coordinated by the Office of Strategic Planning and primary considerations are the efficient, efficient use of capacity and diversity with secondary considerations, including continuity of neighborhoods, transportation, minimizing school moves for students, long-term enrollment capacity trends in capital plans, feeder school continuity and boundaries, and phasing changes by grade levels in high schools. Next slide, please. A boundary study is initiated by the superintendent. The process of the boundary study is coordinated by the Office of Strategic Planning. The process is facilitated by an independent consultant and is driven by committee participation. Throughout the process, there are several opportunities for community engagement. Meetings are publicly advertised. The public is welcome to attend boundary study committee meetings as an observer. Boundary study committee meetings are live streamed and or recorded, and all information provided to the boundary study committee is posted on the BCPS website following each meeting. Further, prior to the boundary study committee's final recommendation, they will present options in a public information session, and the public is invited to participate in a survey regarding options presented at the public information session. In terms of Board of Education actions, they receive the committee's recommendation at a regularly scheduled board meeting and conduct a public hearing to solicit feedback on the committee's recommendation, as well as evaluating the committee's recommendation and feedback received from the community, and then they approve, deny, or revise the committee's recommendation at a regular, regularly scheduled, scheduled board meeting. Next slide, please. This, shows, this slide shows the two boundary studies that we began last month in September and the actions that we've taken to date. I'm not gonna read through all the dates that are on there, but we've had several meetings to date and we have several planned. The purpose of the Northwest Elementary Boundary School Study Number One is to expand the attendance area for Bedford Elementary School replacement, anticipated to open in fall 2024, expand attendance area for Summit Park Elementary School replacement, anticipated to open in fall 2024, provide capacity relief to participating Northwest Elementary Schools, and facilitate the move of students currently attending Campfield ELC to attend their home school or other nearby programs programs. The Central Area Elementary School Capacity Relief Boundary Study has a purpose to relieve schools projected to be overcrowded and to maximize use of available space <coughs> at elementary schools in the region. Next slide, please. Thank you, Dr. Grimm. At this time, we'd like to share our new focus as it relates to community engagement and enhancements with our boundary study. Um, we've kind of categorized them into three broad areas. The Boundary Study Committee, community, community Notifications, and Community Feedback. As a part of this process, BCPS is committed to enhancing the boundary change process. As a result of feedback and reflection, the following enhancements are planned or are already underway as part of the current planning stage boundary studies. As I stated, Boundary Study Committee. It's ensuring diversity of community members, engaging in an exercise to evaluate boundary study considerations, capacity building through the Department of Equity and Cultural Proficiency, and establishing parameter, parameters for taking options to public information sessions. In regards to community notifications, our purpose is to engage stakeholders at school information meetings, to assist schools with communications, and our goal is leveraging BCPS's partnerships with Baltimore County government to connect with communities and constituents. In terms of community feedback, we're leveraging school liaisons, ESOL, equity, and family community engagement staff to engage community members. Our goal is to leverage partnerships with community groups, HOA, recreation councils, 
and the Association of Educate, the AEAC, the, the Association of Education Advisory Councils to engage communities, providing updates to key stakeholder groups, providing transportation to public information centers, centers for school sites to create accessibility and opportunity, improving our online survey, and encouraging participation in the public information sessions. We want you all to keep in mind that we believe that schools are very instrumental in, in engaging their community in this boundary study process. Next slide, please. This slide depicts our array of opportunities where there is a renewed focus on just community engagement, but multiple ways in which our community can stay involved and participate in the process. Each Boundary Studies website includes the functionality to provide online comments, which are reviewed and posted on a weekly basis. As you can see in the slide, although it's kind of small, there's a, there's a QR code that the community can access and provide us with their ongoing feedback. A communication toolkit has been provided to principals who have scheduled timely messages to parents regarding the process, meetings, and the public information sessions. Information flyers for each Boundary Study clearly list the dates of the meetings and reminders are sent in terms of the action and the dates. Com committee meetings have been live streamed and after the meetings they are posted to YouTube with the availability of closed caption in multiple languages. Communications have been posting boundary study information via Facebook, X and Instagram as well as to Parent University. Communications has also sent messages to all of the impacted school communities directly via school messenger. Strategic planning has been an amazing partner and has included interactive maps and other information that is provided to or requested by the committee on its website for the public to review. Next slide, please. Uh, thank you for allowing us to present updates on our renewed focus regarding the boundary study process. At this time, we'll take any questions that you may have. Board member questions? Ms. Pumphrey? Just have a comment. Um, first, thank you for this renewed focus. It seems like we're doing as much as we can to reach communities that um, we may, may not often reach or we may, we may not have as much participation as we would like. I would like to see that as we are progressing, that we are looking at where we may have holes, where we are not reaching communities um, as, we, as we progress instead of waiting for that, those numbers at the end, because those numbers always concern me. And I want to be sure that we're reaching every community in as, as much as possible. It sounds like we are doing as much as we can, but I'd like to see an update of those numbers or feedback from each community um, as we move along so that we can intentionally reach some of the communities that maybe we aren't reaching if we notice that along the way. Yes, and we appreciate that feedback. One of the things that Dr. Grimm and I are committed to is making, sh making sure that um, staff from our divisions are represented at the meetings and then we debrief those meetings to get a sense of um, who attended, what were some of the topics, so you're right that it becomes an ongoing process. And thank you for sharing your concerns about, you know, just representation. I, to piggyback what she said, what identifying information goes on when someone um, submits a comment online? What Do you know what community, what school they're from, or is it completely anonymous? So there, there's, I believe there's some identifying information in the, in the background that's not posted. However, um, we, it says right on the website, do not include names as part of the post and other information. So I, I do think we, we have a sense of where they're coming from, but I will double check that to make okay. sure. Okay, so yeah. even if it just had a school or something so that yes. we would know which communities are and, we not. Okay. And we're also taking, and I'm sorry, I didn't That's mean to okay. cut you off, Chair Go Lecter. Um, we're also taking emails and, and comments that we're receiving from the public. Um, they are uh, being included as, as needed. We're encouraging folks to, to list those comments on the website. Um, we've also broadened our scope to ensure that as community partners, HOAs have reached out to the school system with concerns. We're having very various um, staff from our offices and from the Office of Equity, Office of Communications, reach out to those stakeholders as well as a follow-up. Do principals kind of get a package of like, or reminders of how to keep their um, school community informed that there's an upcoming meeting or, or just this ongoing reminders about how they can, I know we're getting messages from a lot of people who, don't re who think the recommendation has already been made or that we're receiving, you know, they don't understand the process. So. Do principals get updates on how to inform their community as the process goes on? 
Yes, that's correct. And they, they've actually received a toolkit okay. with various communications that are pre-made that they can send out via messenger. But also our, our Department of Communications has done an amazing job of making sure that all the reminders are going out uh, community-wide. They're actually leveraging not only um, those social media pieces that Dr. Jones noted, but they're sending out messages to each school community via school messenger. So, in fact, I think we're getting some saturation right. in some ways soon they'll tell us stop stop so that's correct <laughs> that's okay yeah we'll we'll take the the you know too much information we, too many reminders we want to make sure we're right. we're really getting the word out as much as possible okay thank you uh, miss booger dwyer i i love this um approach and my only question is just around like that multi-directional communication and so are you all i know it's almost impossible to respond to every single you know message but are you creating some type of handout or summary of, you know, this is what we heard and now this is what we did. And even if you didn't do anything, if you just heard it and said, okay, we didn't act on this because, is there something like that that's going out so that you could take everything that you've heard from the community and they know that you've listened and that you've responded in some way? So you take that one. Yeah, so, I, so I, I think there's there's a couple parts to that question. So one of the things that, that we've really been trying to do is to uh, improve the, the web page that includes not only the interactive maps, but the QR code with the comments online and try to drive um, folks that, that email us or call us mm -hmm. to the web page for each of the boundary studies where they can publicly comment. And some people are, are comfortable doing that, others are not. But if they publicly comment there, it is it becomes a part of the record. Um, as part of this process, it's really important to understand that the Office of Strategic Planning coordinates this process. So their role isn't to 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 hear one community or one group over another. As as the coordinator, they want to make sure that the facilitator, our, our outside consultant, is able to see that and to be able to respond to it. So to answer your question, um, what we're doing is we're making sure that we're collecting and driving those folks to the website and making sure that the public comments are there. And on the back end, strategic planning, the Department of Schools, our other offices, whether it's transportation, facilities, uh, curriculum and instruction, are preparing materials from meeting to meeting to, to respond to questions that come up through the committee. So for example, if um, an additional map or rendering is needed or a suggestion is made at one of the studies, as Dr. Jones said, we're trying to regroup after and say, this piece of information would be helpful for them to make a, a, another decision or just to have more information. That's helpful. And then is there any, um, I know that, you know, there's certain meeting dates scheduled, but are there any, sometimes, you know, when you have these things at schools, people don't come. So is there a plan to kind of hit the street sometime or to, you know, set up in front of a grocery store or to go to a church or something like that where you're announcing like what's happening to the community, where they organically go to? Um, because sometimes to, to have it at a school, you don't you won't get the people who are not used to going to the school or who may work shift work or, you know, those kind of things. But if you even just put a table out in front of the Wegmans or the Food Lion or whatever is in their community, um, just to spread the word because they're going to go there or, you know, at, at their church or w wherever, um, just to get the word out. That just may be something to consider. Ms. Booker Dwyer, if I could respond to that one. Um, thank you. Currently, uh, in earnest, there are no uh, set out plans right. to uh, go out into the community, but I think it's something that we can take back and maybe work with our community engagement about what are some of those, uh, you know, different opportunities that may exist. Um, you know, for us to just make sure that the information is out in one form or another. Mm -hmm. So I'm not sure with these two studies that are currently occurring uh, that, you know, staff will be able to do that. Um, however, it's something that we can plan for in the future one way or another to leverage some of our external partnerships in that way. Ms. Harvey. Thank you, Madam Chair. I have, um, I too appreciate the expanded outreach. Uh, I am and you'll probably hear me say this 20 times, a believer in making the thing you want people to do the easiest thing to do. And so I've heard you say website, 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 but I am finding it difficult to find the information on the website. 
on the BCPS website. So I'm wondering if you can consider a link on the homepage that will that when parents go to the website, they can see that link, you know, boundary study, click it, and it'll take them through directly there rather than having to go through the steps to get to strategic planning, to get to here, to get to, to there. So that's just one uh, recommendation because you're doing the work and we want people to not get discouraged around, I'm looking for it, but I can't find it. We want it to be a breadcrumb right there for them. So I, I appreciate that. And also, are any of the schools, uh, community schools, and have we considered how we might use the community school facilitator whose job it is to do outreach to perform some of those roles in terms of getting out into the community uh, and talking to people where they are? So again, I, I would say and um, reiterate what Dr. Rogers has shared, and that's what I was going to say even to Ms. Booker Dwyer. Um, we appreciate the, the suggestions and the recommendations about how we can expand our outreach, and we're definitely taking that down as something for consideration um, so that we don't have to say we think that's happening, but we can offer that as a recommendation that we know is happening within our schools. So thank you for the recommendation. Thank you. We appreciate your work. Ms. Dominowski? I just have one question. I'm not sure if this is something you guys can answer, but when will the um, committees be updated with the September 30th enrollments so that they have the updated student enrollments for the schools, or will they be working off those from this year? So the the final September 30th enrollments won't be available until November. Um, by the way that the by the way the um, by the way that they're verified. We are continually updating them and we'll continually provide them with updated numbers and figures, but the official uh, September 30th enrollment d does not become validated until November. But don't you have to, I mean, you have to submit September 30th deadlines to the state. Like they have and to have that number, correct? That's correct, but that's not submitted actually until the end of October. So the September 30th enrollment for this year yeah. doesn't actually go to the state until the end of October. Okay, I'm just concerned that yeah. we're using outdated information when we have updated information. Sure, and and I think that that providing the uh, providing those updates um, is very reasonable and is a suggestion that we already have in the works. Um, but in terms of the official MSDE data, we we don't provide that for another month. Okay, but I mean I'm. I, it's the data that you are working for might be verified for last year, but it's also not verified for this year. So what would be the difference of using the data? Ms. Dominowski, I certainly hear the uh, concern that you're raising. Uh, once we uh, submit the data to the state of Maryland and once we release it to Baltimore County Public Schools, uh, this committee will also receive that information. Um, it, it's not likely that there's going to be huge uh, percentage of variances, uh, especially since they have access to the uh, student counts handbook with what the enrollment projections are for the next 10 years, as well as actuals for the uh, few years preceding. And so um, I, I think, you know, them receiving that information within, we're talking about a, I don't know, it's probably six weeks from now, they have enough time in the process to make the adjustments as uh, necessary. And we're probably talking about a few percentage, a uh, few percentage points in the uh, specific schools that are involved in this boundary study. No, and I do respect that. It's just that a few percentage points make a big difference in some of these schools. So that's why I, would, I was working, would like to get as much, you know, close to the, the numbers as we can. So Definitely we can. hear that. And you have our commitment that we will create space for those committees to adjust whatever their recommendation is based on the actual numbers. Thank you very much. Other questions? Ms. Stoleski? Thank you, and thank you for the thorough presentation. Um, one thought that I had with the luxury that the study is for elementary schools, and since elementary school students have a take-home folder to reach families that might not be technologically inclined, what about a, a flyer? One for the central boundary study for those communities and one for the Northwest, and that way it's just another means of making sure that everybody is reached. Thank you. So thanks for that recommendation. We we actually, on the slide, it's very difficult to see. Yeah. There is a flyer that we do have and was provided as part of the toolkit. 
However, we can follow up to to make sure that 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 has been provided. Take home folder. Yep. I got and one. That's been provided. Wonderful. Oh, you did. <laughs> I thought she meant another question. You mean you got a flyer? <laughs> you got a flyer. Okay. Wonderful. <laughs> that's okay. That's that inundation, right? Um, Ms. Frampong, did you have a question or a comment? So we are currently still using the same contractor that we used for the previous boundary study for the new Northeast Middle, correct? For this process? We are using Cropper GIS, yes. Okay. So I really appreciate all of the work that you guys are doing to increase the community outreach um, and the committee itself always, it's, it's hard work. Mm -hmm. um, looking at all these numbers and trying to figure out what's best. Um, my concern from last time came because of the response to the survey. And so ha are there gonna be any parameters that are changed as far as looking at the number of responses that are coming in before finally making a recommendation so that we see that there's more even distribution among all of the schools and communities that are affected? So thank you, thank you for that comment. So the first thing that I'd like to say is we've, um, staff have, have actually met with Cropper b b prior to these two studies beginning in September. And we've changed some of the parameters and how we've asked them to facilitate the process for these two, uh, given the feedback from the board. So we've already started to make some of those changes. Um, in terms of looking at the survey, we've, we've actually, um, we're, we're pushing another more community and public survey around what those responses are. And I think um, your point about us interrogating those data as we receive them before we make a recommendation is on point. Any other um, questions? I, I participate in a lot of boundary studies and I think having that extra staff there is huge. Sometimes there's nuances in discussions that are lost when it was um, just kind of one office. So I think you know having those meetings afterwards and really listening, because that's the feedback we got from the last one is that this suggestion was made but somehow not heard and not followed through on. So I think the more staff that you have there that can really listen um, will also lend voice to those that may not, you know, be the loudest voices in the room. So thank you for adding that component. Thank you. All right, thank you for that um, presentation. You two still stay there because I think you're up next. Nope, yes? Oh, no, okay, Dr. Rogers says you can go back. All right, I gotta get my script back up here. Okay, let me see. So next. Isn't it the, okay, they, they added some for, okay. So next on the agenda, whoop, okay, never mind. <laughs> the next item on the agenda is a report on academic achievement and highly effective staff, Blueprint Pillar 1. Um, and this is gonna be focused on early childhood education. And for that, I think my names aren't quite accurate. We have Dr. Wisted, Dr. DiDonato, and I think, um, Dr. Rogers, are you beginning this one? Yes. Okay. Thank you again. Uh, this evening, we are pleased to share a report on Pillar 1 Early Childhood Education. This is the first installation in a series of reports regarding the blueprint legislation and specifically uh, the impact in Baltimore County Public Schools, uh, our progress, and our next steps. Next slides, please. Pillar one is focused on increased ac increasing access and opportunity for our students, uh, specifically ensuring that our students have access to high quality full day preschool programs. National and international educational researchers and economists continue to affirm the impact and value of high quality preschool education to students. Specifically, 50% of the achievement gap in high school is attributed to early learning differences in schools. Preschool attendance almost always results in additional learning anywhere from four months to one additional year of learning. The impact of preschool is felt as far away as high school, college and career attainment, and higher adult earnings for all students. So at this time, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. DiDonato and Dr. Wisted uh, for them to dig into Pillar 1, specifically what it's about, each tenant of Pillar 1, and the current state of Baltimore County Public Schools, and our next steps to expand. Thank you. Next slide, please. Oh, okay, there it is. Uh, so Pillar 1 
specifically in that legislation that Dr. Rogers was talking about, it was passed in 2021, Pillar 1 specifically talks about ensuring that we have initiatives to um, have all families access full day pre-kindergarten at no cost or reduced cost. Um, and that would be with public and private providers so that there's partnerships and also expanding the wraparound services for our students and families. It talks about expanding the publicly funded full day pre-K for all four-year-olds and then low income three-year-old students. Again, in that public slash private um, system, it's also looking to increase the number of high quality early childhood service providers, including educators and the paraeducator or teaching assistant that's in the classroom. It expands supports for young children and their families. And the goal is to improve the readiness um, for students in kindergarten. Part of that also talks about looking at our current half day sessions and expanding them to full day sessions while also bringing on more full day sessions. Next slide, please. This one talks about the tiers that we have. And so when we have families register, there's a new requirement that we um, collect income information from them to understand if they're tier one, tier two, or tier three. So our tier one, three and four year olds are supposed to be offered a full day program if they have an income less than or equal to 300% of the federal poverty level, which right now is just under $80,000 a year, and other automatic qualifiers are students receiving special education services, students uh, qualifying as potential English learners, students experiencing homelessness, and are in the foster care system. Um, that's supposed to be implemented currently as we speak, and tier two is focused on four-year-olds. Again, the family income level changes slightly where it's between 300 and not more than 600% of the federal poverty level. Um, again, families have that choice to enroll or not. Uh, in July of 2024, we have to discuss and decide what our sliding scale eligibility will be because we do have the option to charge families that are within the tier two. And then finally, Tier three is, again, four-year-old programs for a family income that is more than 600% of the federal poverty level. And um, it is always the family's option whether or not they want to enroll their child. Next slide. So here we're talking about how we've done this in BCPS. Uh, you may recall I mentioned how we have to look at our half-day slots and convert them to full day, as well as bring on more full day slots to be able to have the option to serve all of our families. Uh, currently, what we've done is we have a cross-divisional and office group where we are looking at our half-day sessions, our schools that have space, we work with transportation, we work with the Office of Budgeting, we work with the Office of Staffing, where we look at if there's a school, for instance, that has two half-day sessions, we don't want to reduce the number of opportunities we have. That's typically 40 students that we're serving, so then we're looking for two locations, right, two classrooms where those two half-day sessions used to be in one classroom, now they have to be in two classrooms. So that's the pattern we've been using to try to expand. And you see that in um, FY23, we expanded to six different schools. We added 15 sections. We grew this year even more. And um, we currently have full-day sessions at the following schools, Arbutus, Berkshire, Chesapeake Terrace, Chase, Church Lane, Franklin, Glenmar, Halstead, Harford Hills, Hawthorne, Joppa View, Lansdowne, Maiden Choice, Martin Boulevard, McCormick, Middlesex, Oliver Beach, Perry Hall, Powhatan, Riverview, Rossville, Sandalwood, Sandy Plains, Seneca, Shady Spring, Victory Villa, White Oak, and Winfield. And we have a goal to add even more sections for the FY25 year. Here we're showing 40 plus additional sections. We're really hoping that number is going to be larger. But again, we're in those final stages of meeting with the team to understand what can be done with staffing, transportation, space, you know, all of those layers. Um, also, what we do is when uh, families enroll, you know, we're serving more than just tier one students currently. So when families enroll, 
Uh, we request that schools hold uh, a waiting list. So if you are not a tier one student or family, you're on a waiting list until August 25th, but they still hold four additional spots in each session for families that may be automatic qualifiers. And then we wait until September 15th, in which case then we contact the rest of the families on the waiting list. So right now we are serving more than just our tier one families. Next slide. So part of Pillar 1 also talks about um, transforming some of our services for students with disabilities. So we're also looking at this opportunity to really provide more inclusive special education services. So as we are opening these full day programs, they're being staffed with a different type of staffing formula. So they have a full-time teacher, a full-time paraeducator, an additional adult assistance, as well as a .5 special educator that's really focusing on the early childhood learning opportunities for students. What we want to do is while we are working towards providing full day uh, preschool and pre-kindergarten for our students, we're also looking to bring more students back to their home schools and provide appropriate, inclusive, supportive services for them whenever possible. One of the things that we've done in currently in our service model is we, um, schools that don't have pre-K, we will identify a different school with pre-K for them. Schools that don't have uh, intensive special education services for our early learners, we will identify a different school to send students to. So with the idea of really bringing students back to their community schools where they can access before school, after school, activities, be with their peers, ride a neighborhood bus, walk to school, or drive to school, um, we are really optimizing this opportunity to support all of our students within their schools. Um, in order to do that, we're providing additional professional development that's being done in collaboration between the offices of special education and the offices of birth to five, really looking at those inclusive practices with universal design, um, evidence-based practices, as well as um, utilization of our new pre-K curriculum, which was uh, implemented, uh, purchased last year, implemented this year, um, at Connect for Learning. Next slide. Uh, Dr. Wisted spoke about the idea of uh, public-private uh, partnerships with pre-kindergarten. The idea is that public schools may not have the ability to have seats for all students who are eligible for pre-K services. So private pre-K providers are able to apply and get approved by MSDE as approved pre-K providers. If that's the case and a family decides to um, comes to a Baltimore County School, it might be one of our schools that only has a half day program currently, we are poised to try to connect them with, if possible, a local provider who is approved by MSDE who can offer a full day pre-K program. Again, working in partnership that it is a collective goal for the county to provide um, full day pre-K and preschool services. What you can see on the graphic is that um, last school year, 22-23, um, in Baltimore County, there were four MSDE-sponsored um, private providers. They had a total of 150 seats. That means how many seats their whole child care centers had available. So that could be then with students from Baltimore County Public, or possible Baltimore County Public School students. It could also be a student from Anne Arundel County. Those are just the one, the providers that are within the Baltimore County boundary. For the current school year, there are six MSD providers, which then increase the number of seats within their programs to 217. Part of Pillar 1.1 really also talks about the ability of Baltimore County Public Schools to support prov provided providers to create continuity for students. The idea is that you might go to a preschool in a private provider, you might go to pre-K, but eventually you might come to us for kindergarten and we want to create that cohesive pathway. So we will provide uh, training and professional development in tandem with the private providers. We, through a Judy Center grant, will provide curriculum so the students are getting the same curriculum at those private providers as we're offering in Baltimore County Public Schools. We do conscious discipline training for their staff and we really do try to create a partnership with them. Next slide. Part of the uh, Pillar 1 also talks about our kin kinder bleh, kindergarten readiness assessment. What we really want to see is that all this work that we're doing with our three and four year olds is going to pay dividends when we look at our kindergarten readiness assessment for our students. So the KRA is administered in the fall of every school year. Any student enrolled in kindergarten on September 1st is administered the assessment. 
Um, this is a, a teacher-driven assessment, so they do a lot of individualized assessment uh, components with students, as well as some group observational uh, data collection. It's entered into a system um, to MSDE. We usually don't get our results back until December or beginning of January. However, when we do receive them, although we do have other measures along the way to see how our students are doing, we use that as almost a, okay, they were here at the beginning of the year, what are our other measures tell us about where they are now? We do administer the MAP assessment in kindergarten in the winter for our students. So sometimes it's a really great thing for teachers to see because when we do get the KRE data back, they can see where the students were at the start of the school year and see where they are at the middle of the school year. So you can start seeing the progress that students are making. Um, the Early Childhood Office, as well as um, in partnership with our Department of Research Accountability and Assessment, provides training for the teachers on how to administer the assessment. Um, and there's constant monitoring about the implementation of the assessment, the completion of the assessment, um, to make sure that we are administering all parts to all of our students so that we have those, that full picture of our students at, when we receive those scores back. Next slide. Pillar 1.3, so hopefully you're seeing a theme with um, Pillar 1. It's really wraparound services for the whole young learner from um, as early as birth to five, to kindergarten age. So we talked a lot about services for our three and four year olds. Um, our expanded family supports are really looking at some of those supports and services for our youngest children from birth to age three or till they start in a school setting. So we have something called Judy Centers. Baltimore County currently has four of them at uh, Campfield, Bedford, Hawthorne, uh, Bedford, located at Campfield, sorry, Hawthorne Elementary, Featherbed, and Sandalwood. Judy Learning Center, Judy Centers, uh, strive to provide positive early learning experiences for students with their families. So the idea is that students' first teachers are their parents, their caregivers, and their families. So Judy Centers provide those wraparound supports and services to families to support their young learners at home. They do things like collaborative play groups, um, parenting workshops, uh, connect family with resources. Connect families with resources within the community. So, if a parent or caregiver has uh, a need for uh, dental assistance or mental health um, services, even for their youngest children, the duty centers serve as a conduit to help provide them access and make connections with those programs. The other early childhood, uh, early early support offered is for our is through our infants and toddlers program. So, this is. Um, students who, parents, caregivers who have uh, concerns about maybe the developmental milestones of their students can contact our office and make a referral for their student to be assessed by infants and toddlers. Infants and toddlers provide services to families in the most natural setting, so it could be in their home, it could be in their daycare, it could be at a library, it could be at a local church. Um, we do have some infants and toddler groups that meet in some of our schools so that they can have group settings of the kids together. Again, this is another opportunity to provide direct services to students, and at the same time, the idea with infants and toddlers is really that family support and that family and parent training so that we're supporting students, working on those developmental milestones, and at the same time, providing families with those resources, tools, and strategies to provide those extra supports for them. Next slide. We will take any questions that you may have. Questions, Mr. McMillian? It's, it's just under that. So if I did my math right, less than or equal to 300% of that, is that $24,000? No, no, the, the up to 300% poverty level is a family income of just under $80,000. So 300% of the federal poverty level is just under $80,000. $80, so in a, a couple presentations that previously, going to need them, but there might be some that didn't have the funding to put into becoming certified MSDE certified. So Correct. you talked about there was there was discussion about making funding available, whether loans or whatever, to those. So Did the, that ever, ever progress? 
So what, it's through MSDE, so the private provider must apply for a grant through the Maryland State Department of Education. And if they meet all the credentialing and follow all the same requirements that publicly we're required to follow, they receive the funding, the per pupil allocation for the full day student as we do as a public institution. But they have to follow all of the same rules, quote unquote, that we follow in order to receive the funding. And you were mm -hmm. concerned at one point that there might not be enough seats, especially if they didn't pursue, mm -hmm. if the private providers didn't pursue those grants, there would be some communities, and, and some of my communities might be there. Correct. So um, Dr. DiDonato talked about how many we have right now. Right. I think that number was we have six different providers only providing us with 200. 17 seats. Yeah. Yep. Seats. So part of the goal is that outreach from the school system, our early childhood office, to provide support for those other local providers who might not yet have taken the leap to apply for um, their MSD credentials. So when we <coughs> enroll students in school as Sorry. kindergartners, um, we identify something called prior care. So we know what preschools, daycares, child care students went to as four-year-olds. So looking at that information, looking at, you know, if um, that's a families in a certain community might go to ABC Child Care Center, is there an opportunity for us to support ABC Child Care Center in becoming an MSD approved private provider? So reaching out to them, providing that would you like to come to conscious discipline training? What are the uh, <coughs> concerns that you have with accreditation? What are those things that we can try to do to help? Because, and again, the goal is that it's a mixed delivery model, um, and we need all, not just the public schools, but all private providers to help ensure that we have enough seats for all the students. Other questions from board members? Ms. Pumphrey? I just have a question about um, the KRA slide. Um, you mentioned other, two questions actually, you mentioned other measures. Can you describe what some of those other measures are? And secondly, once you have that data regarding the KRA and the um, measures that you have prior, what do you do with that data? So um, in addition to KRA, we administer the MAP assessment, <coughs> which is the same assessment we use um, throughout elementary school um, for both reading and math. Um, we do it for kindergartners in the winter and then again in the spring. So essentially over time we'll have the KRA, which would be our start of the school year data, our MAP reading and math data for the middle of the year, and then again at the end of the year. Um, we also, for our younger students, do something called the early learning assessment, which we do with pre-kindergartners as well as kindergartners, which is again a monitoring of some of those foundational skills. So we look at it all together. So when MAP data is available, because depending on the MAP window, because it's a long window, knowing that schools have to test kindergarten all the way through fifth graders. Um, if they administer it early to their kindergartners, um, they might have that data available before they even receive their KRA data. So again, um, school teams will work together to look at that. We provide professional development to um, school administrators, staff development teachers, um, and our resource teachers within our school building on how to disaggregate that to really look at, okay, what are the skills where students are showing strengths? Where are the areas of need? How does that, again, coincide with what we see going on in classrooms every day? So what is the quality of instruction that's going on in a room? How do we see them grouping students? How are teachers following up with students based on the data? Um, and so the KRA, although while it's lagging data, it does provide some information. Thank you. Other questions, Ms. Booker-Dwyer? I just had a question regarding the mixed delivery system for pre-K and the, the resource sharing that's associated with it. So I know that they get the per pupil funding from MSDE. So if they're using, so are they purchasing the curriculum that we're using or are we allowing them access to, to our curriculum um, or are we inviting them to the professional development and they're paying for to go, like could you talk a little bit about how that Who's paying for them? Um, that, I guess that's what I'm really asking. It is not coming from BCPS operating budget. It is coming from MSD grants that we may apply for that is to really build that community partnership. So Baltimore County is at the lead of it, helping provide those resources and those trainings. So yes, the private providers would be 
invited to professional learning. So at the start of the school year, we had a week-long professional learning for our pre-K teachers. Private providers were invited to participate in those. Um, so we do try to, and there's some providers who say, we have our own program. We don't want what you're doing. Um, but again, it's the offer of the collaboration and the partnership and really trying to support and looking at maybe smaller providers who don't have all of those resources in place, this could be very instrumental in supporting them to becoming MSD accredited. And so there's no real accountability for them to, so they, they become MSD accredited, but then there's no real accountability for BCPS. We have no authority over them, I guess what I'm saying, is what I'm saying, for them to implement the sound curriculum, for them to engage in the professional development. Mm -hmm. So we still can't be 100% sure that the private providers are providing an educational experience that's comparable to BCPS. Correct, but one of well, the, yeah, I mean, they, they do have to go through the same accreditation, accreditation right. process, it's, which they're monitored by the Maryland State Department of Education. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, do they? Right. And then um, when it comes to things like the enrollment, you know, so like the students who are enrolled, will they have access to, you know, in, enroll their students? Do we know, I, I get after the fact, when they come into BCPS, we know which ones they, the, the pre-Ks that they went to. Um, but while they're in pre-K, is there any type of monitoring or um, enrollment that we're doing with them on the BCPS side so that we know, or is all that data just coming afterwards? So you're very forward thinking. Right now it is um, not very sophisticated, right? We're using Excel spreadsheets, but we are working with our Department of Informational Technology to have a centralized system so that we can account for the students in this way when they come to us. We know that, you know, where they've been before, we already have that information. Um, so we're working on that. Thanks. Yeah. Is there a way to go back to the slide that had the numbers of seats? It was like towards the beginning, if you solve it up. So that slide, just to make sure I understand, you've got like the past on there and you got up to like next year, mm -hmm. correct? Yes. Okay, so do we, have a, do we have any idea how many seats we think that we're going to need? I mean, I know the private providers, we just went to a state conference and that it's not a county issue. The providers across the state are just not there. Mm -hmm. um, I think MSD had thought we'd have this, you know, huge influx and it's not happening. So do we have any idea how many seats we're gonna need and how many we're short? Um, and especially if we, yes, says Dr. Rogers in my ear. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we know. Okay. So we have um, worked with strategic planning and they worked with um, an outside provider, Sage, to come up with a number for our up to 300% three and four year olds, that number is 8,000 approximately. Um, if we wanna serve everyone, you can assume we have approximately 8,000 students per grade level, so if we wanna serve everyone, that would be 16,000 for three year olds and four year olds. And so how many, for fiscal year 25, you had on that slide, correct? 1,700, we're hoping. We have 1,700 more, or we had 1,700 total? That would be total. Okay, that's where I was confused. So 1,700 total, but full eventually, day. full day, but eventually we may need? 8,000 for up to 300% okay. poverty. We still have the half day programs also, so it's not that it's just this full day and these are the only students we serve. We do have other schools that have half day programs, but maybe we don't have the space to open two classrooms and we don't wanna lose. 20 seats, so we keep the two half-day programs. So this isn't a totality, of, this is the totality of full day. Okay, and I should know, but the pillar says full day, correct? Correct. Okay, so we're still short, lots of seats, okay. But it's volunteer, right? Right. Okay, so the 8,000 would be the most if everybody that we think is out there decided we're gonna come to schools. Yes, okay. correct. All right. Thank you. Any other questions, comments, clarification, Ms. Frempong? So um, I, you had mentioned on the um, one slide about where the Judy schools are, the Judy centers, I apologize. So I guess I was thinking as far as like the services that they do, and I understand we're trying to expand, but especially when we talk about those things like the wraparound services, I guess has there been any thought given to partnering or putting more of those Judy centers in our community? 
Oh, in the community schools, um, duty centers are located in our Title I schools, which oftentimes are also our community schools, um, to expand those programs because they do require staffing, a certain amount of resources. We do rely on an MSD grant to do that. Um, so there's a little bit of pacing along with what's available from MSD for us to do that. It is absolutely a plan of ours to continue to expand it. The um, MSD grant information for next school year will come out in um, between April and May. We will be applying for that. What we can say is that the whole concept with community schools, which is also a you know out birth of, of Blueprint, is really to provide those services, resources, connections within that whole community. So while a Judy Center has a more concentrated focus on our earliest, youngest students who live within a community, our community school coordinators and facilitators are doing community outreach to an entire community. So it's not just the students who attend that school, it's to future students who might attend that school and families. And a couple more questions. Okay. So the one slide where you were talking about special education, and I believe there were three adults, and you mentioned full-time, full-time, full-time. <laughs> I think you said 0.5 special educators. So what does that mean? Like, what does that actually look like in a classroom? So a 0.5 special educator, schools can use it in a very various ways. So if you chose to use it, uh, two full days and a half day is the equivalent, or okay. five half days. It doesn't mean that's the, their only special education allocation. This was just an additional what above um, what is the staffing ratio for special education. So if a school is supposed to, you know, their staffing ratio for inclusion teachers might be 2.5, we are adding an additional 0.5 so that they have three full-time special educators to provide. In some cases, we're really trying to provide that early intervention services for students, but it allows us the flexibility to provide additional services as students may need them. Okay, and then for the um, independence and toddlers program, for example, if a parent has concerns, so you, you kind of answered this, I guess, with community school facilitators getting the word out, but how otherwise does the word get out that there's resources available for these early childhood and, and infant issues? So infants and toddlers, um, a lot of communication comes out from the Baltimore County Health Department. Um, sometimes uh, children's um, pediatricians may recommend or refer them or complete the referral. Um, students who are children who are born prematurely are more likely automatically um, recommended for infants and toddler services, at least for the parents to explore that. Um, so uh, last school year, um, there were uh, 2,700 referrals to infants and toddlers. Um, and over the course of the school year, they ended up serving um, 3,215 students, children, um, ages birth to three. So infants and toddlers does provide you know, a variety of services, and there's various provide, uh, ways that we support families in accessing those. Thank you. And then last piece related specifically to Blueprint. Um, and the full-time daycare. So the private providers can get trained by us, but is there, uh, so two questions then, I guess, do they have any requirement then to serve BCPS students? Because right in the facility, it could be other areas, but if BCPS is paying for that training or applying for the grant, I guess, so that um, they can get the training, is there type any type of commitment then that we reserve the the provider will reserve a certain amount of seats for BCPS students, and then how many actually participate in the programs when you put it out there to them? So there is no requirement that they um, hold seats for us to, to answer that part of the question. Um, and then as far as the numbers of our students, again, we just have Excel spreadsheets. We don't have a really sophisticated system um, to find that out. So, you know, we, we just have the numbers that we provided to you, that there were the, the 200 seats for this year, and it was 100 and I forget what, last year. Oh, okay, so how, is that the number of providers? That's no, the, number the number of, of seats. seats. We had four providers last year and six providers this year. So if it's a child care center that has um, you know five preschool classrooms and five pre-K classrooms, it would be the total number of children they could enroll in that child care center. 
So, and as far as your question, as far as the, you know, enrolling a Baltimore County student, so if they enroll a Baltimore County student that meets the um, tier one eligibility, they get the equivalent of the per pupil allocation funding for that student. So there is a fiscal motivation <laughs> for them to support Baltimore County students, especially if they're um, meeting that eligibility criteria for tier one. Okay, got it. And then just to be clear on the response. So what you're providing is the number of, of seats that the provider has, but my question was how many providers, so we're not sure. Providers? It was four providers oh. last year and six providers this year. Thank you. <laughs> okay, got it. Thank you. It's no a problem. low number. <laughs> yeah. It's a very low number, yes. <laughs> Any other questions or comments about the Pillar 1 presentation? So how much are our taxes going to go up to pay for all? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah, I that cannot was... answer that one. <laughs> yes. Um, I'm just laughing because we went to a, a state conference and the poor presenters were getting kind of beat up with because it all adds up. And this is just pillar one. We haven't talked about. We have the, some more to go. Right. It's a whole series, right. So thank you for providing all the information, for answering all of our questions. We um, truly appreciate it. Um, Thank you. Okay, you're welcome. And the next item on the agenda is board member comments and agenda setting. So um, again, feel free to pass if you don't have anything. Um, Ms. Dominowski, can I start? You're good? Okay, good. Mr. Young? Okay, Ms. Frempong? I'm good, thank you. Okay, Ms. Stileski? I, I really like that somebody mentioned next week is kindness week. So that's always good to remember. <laughs> um, Ms. Booker Dwyer. I, have, I just want to say thank you to all the principals and assistant principals um, during this month. Thank you. Mr. McMillian. No, thank you. Okay. Dr. Savoy. Nothing, thank you. Okay. Ms. Pumphrey. Yes, I'm going to go there. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> go ahead. Go there. <laughs> um, first, I would like to acknowledge the bravery of our student speakers this evening. I am grateful that they came to speak this evening because the voices of our students are so important. I encourage, uh, encourage us as a board to prohibit political noise from drowning out the voices of our most vulnerable students who may not have the opportunity or ability to speak up for themselves. I would also like to encourage us to prohibit political noise from distracting us from our focus on student, student achievement, putting our students first in our decision making, and looking to data when making decisions to support each and every student. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Drummond, Ms. Harvey? Thank you, Madam Chair. I just want to uh, let everyone know that the Building and Contracts Committee is meeting next month, November 6th, Monday at 5 p.m., and we encourage uh, the community to please attend. Thank you. Um, and I just, we had a very long waiting list tonight um, for the first time for public speakers. So those speakers, if you're still listening, um, can send us their comments. We do get all of the comments that you send to the BOE at bcps.org. So we encourage you and we thank you for coming out um, and trying to speak tonight. And the last thing are announcements. Ms. Hen. Ms. I'm sorry, Ms. Hen. I'm sorry, do you have any comments or agenda items? No, I'll just say good night and pass. Just wanted to say that. Thank you. Okay, thank you. The last item on the agenda is announcements. The board's next meeting will be held on Tuesday, October 24th, 2023 at 6.30 p.m. Thank you for joining us tonight, and the meeting is adjourned.